So this is the last class before the presentation. So this is going to be kind of my um, attempt to, you know, rid everything else that I uh, uh, that I want to express to you guys. You know, because uh, because there's so much more to this field than than the things that we have seen. And so I want my mission is kind of to make you want to continue to pursue this field after this class. And I'm even going to make a, a sort of invocation towards the end of today to join me on a project that's that's going to take a village for sure. And so that's that's Abraham and I'll talk about Abraham later. Um, but um, the agenda for today, this last week, is I want to tell you about reinforcement learning, first of all, because that is just a humongous aspect of machine learning that we have hardly touched um, in this class. And so, and you know, so no class would be complete without, you know, getting getting a little bit more, you know, uh, knowing a little bit more about, about that field. Of course, there's, there's a lot of, it's become a lot easier to kind of engage with that. So it might be in future classes might become more of a, an actual component that we use. Then um, I'm going to, just today I finished a notebook for Glow, which is, uh, I think I probably mentioned Glow in one of the classes. It's a generative model that allows you to encode images into the generative model, like actual images, you can re reproject them into the model so that you can do things with that model. And I put it on Colab, so it's going to be really easy for us to use. And so that's going to be at least one more cool thing that you can use. That's, um, you know, nice and easy. And then um, I, I, the goal is kind of to do reinforcement learning, the, this, this lecture on reinforcement learning up to the break. And after the break, we'll do this Glow tutorial. And then that should leave me enough time to basically explain Abraham um, and so so yeah reinforcement learning the amount of tears this pain will bring is in this undescribable agony that there will be no life left in your soul I really love this this is an actual screenshot from Super Mario and um, they're really dark that was their dark period and um, this is actually part of something that I'll show you a little later I think I, if I forget let me know um, yeah, so uh, next week we have final projects. So basically we're devoting the entire class to that. So everyone should, you know, prepare to talk for, uh, let's let's see, there's going to be um, like 16 or something people. So that, that really, you know, that's that's a good five to seven minutes per person. You don't have to take that long. It's, it's all good if you don't. Um, but that's kind of like what everyone is allotted for. And um, like before, if you don't want to show it in class, you can do that. Um, is that a thing that other teachers do where they make it an option to just, no? Okay, then everyone has to present next week. Um, <laughs> so, so then we can kind of like submit the, the grades and everything on time. Um, and uh, for office hours, I'm here tomorrow and maybe some of you already booked me. And, and basically I don't have a calendar thing for Thursday and Friday, but I, I should basically be here for um, uh, like, Thursday afternoon or and Friday. If you want to meet me in one of those days, let me know. Uh, definitely Friday uh, and Thursday is a little bit of a wild card, but like email me and let me know and maybe, maybe we can arrange to meet other days if you need. And then uh, this Friday will also be, I guess the last AI lab or maybe even, maybe there might even be, are you still here next Friday? Or like a one, yeah, 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 one week from? Oh, that's on Friday. No, Sunday, Monday. Yeah. Oh, oh. So people will be here. Okay. Here's I think I may not be here. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Um, well, in any case, so, so this may this may be the last day I lab, and actually I'm looking for suggestions, like what should we do? Anybody have some something, some burning desires for that have to do with AI that we could um, do for AI lab? Anybody? I, I've been looking, I've been reading up a lot about stuff that's been with that's been done with choreography. So a lot of taking the pose net, the dance video to yeah. kind of the next level. But it's with it's it's it, it's done with people who have a lot of um, data on movement and images and like I'm I'm wondering if there's any other way. Um I mean, ask specific questions they can email yeah. later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brandon Newberg uh, it was in my class last year, and he did a project um, in which he collected all the data and then actually did some some choreography based on that. It's it's actually quite reasonable to accum like collect data um, for something. Like, you know, all you have to do is measure someone moving. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the deal is with publicly available data sets. That might be something also. 
Um, but yeah, um, yeah, that's definitely an interesting area. So let, let's let's. There was, a, there was an application that Google Arts and Culture Lab did. They 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 build a system that you teach it the movements and then you say I like this movement and like that mm -hmm. and create something between them. Okay. And it makes you like you know a twenty minute long sequence. Okay, that sounds cool. Um, any other burning desires? <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Reinforcement learning. Let's let's talk about this very exciting field. So, reinforcement learning is it's basically a branch of machine learning which is um, interested in using this machine learning problem setup. You know, where you learn to do something from data in a context in which there is an agent that's interacting with the world, right? So um, that sounds really vague, but, but that's kind of the idea. It's, it's basically a very broad scenario which, which represents virtually everything that we really want to do with machine learning, right? You, you want um, entities to operate in our world and interact with that world and then, um, you know, seeking some objective. And uh, when we use a, you know, like a, an image classifier, it's kind of static. It's in this sort of like self-contained, um, you know, there's no notion of a world. There's no interaction. There's no feedback, nothing like that. And so that doesn't really necessarily represent, uh, you know, like a, a, a neural network is kind of used for in, almost like information gathering or perception. And really, we're interested in making agents, right? And so reinforcement learning, the problem setup of reinforcement learning is you have an, and this will be in the next slide, but you have an agent which is seeking some objective and interacting with the world and it affects the world and the world affects the agent. Um, and so traditionally video games are often used for, uh, for basically doing reinforcement learning because, um, well, to like suppose you want to train a you know um, a robot to walk using reinforcement learning well it'd be really expensive to like build a robot and then have it break a thousand times before it learns how to walk and so like it, it tends to be video games tend to be a really good um like pre-made thing for us to use which uh which is great because uh you know we love video games don't we like we have the game center over here video games are very close to the heart of you know interactive new media and they're very general, right? So usually when people think of video games, they just think of like video games, right? But like the, the video games are, are really, they're like future media. It's like, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of in a, in a more abstract sense, it's, it's probably, I've, I've read interesting articles that, that think that like eventually the way that you interact with the world will be basically like a video game sort of. So um, not, not to be, I mean, sorry? It, it, you just wait. It's it's <laughs> like it's maybe maybe so yeah. But um, but anyway, so yeah, that's kind of the idea. So okay, the limitations of supervised and unsupervised learning. There's no external environment. There's no world in which the agent is is um, interacting, and so there's no feedback mechanism. There's nothing like that. And the reinforcement learning problem is you have an agent, and the agent takes actions inside of a world, and it's pursuing a goal. So, okay, so just to and encapsulate that in graphic form, this is what we mean by supervised learning, right? You have a data set, and from that data set comes an observation X, and the X goes into a model, and we get a prediction or some, you know, some, some piece of information we want to obtain from X, right? That's supervised learning. Um, and so imagine now to kind of take that that idea of supervised learning and and th think of it in the context of reinforcement learning as something like this the x that we get is an observation from an environment you know the like the like in a video game it would be the where everything is you know maybe the pixels um, or maybe you know for a robot it's like a computer vision screen let's say it's like what it's seeing and that is the state so the agent observes the state and it produces some knowledge from that Right, so that's kind of like how we can convert supervised learning into reinfor into like a you know like a perception mechanism for a reinforcement learning agent, and then this is the sort of reinforce this is the classic reinforcement learning setup. You have two entities, an agent and an environment, 
So for example, an agent is a is a robot and an environment is the you know the the, the world basically um, and uh, or in a video game it the agent is the protagonist of the video game and the environment is the you know the game inside inside of which it's operating and the agent takes an action the action affects the environment right so actions affect the environment and the environment uh, basically pr it produces a state an observation like the agent looks at the um, environment to figure out what its action is and it's also receiving some kind of a reward. So this is kind of how reinforcement learning agents are trained, right? So the question is, what should the agent do? And the way that this has to be answered, modeled, is um, that it's seeking some kind of a reward. Um, dopamine, basically. Um, so, may, I mean, uh, um, you know, like the cynical person would say that, that basically this, this is, uh, you know, a life form, a, a human, is an agent interacting in the world seeking dopamine, you know, and, and, and basically something like that. Um, and everything you do explain is basically explained by that. So um, now, uh, <laughs> so of course it's very simplistic, um, but but it's but it's actually there's a lot of complexity that comes that emerges from that. So yeah, that's the that's the again that's the RL setup. Um, examples of these, so you know, things that play so playing games. Um, making robots walk, um, this cute little bicycle riding, um, this little machine that rides a bicycle, it's learned how to do that. Um, and you know, the reward for it is, is not falling, essentially. It's like, and that's, that's, I'm actually quite serious, that's basically what the reward is, don't fall. Um, investing in the stock market, right? Because it turns out that there is an interaction, you know, it's not a static thing, there's actually interaction between the investor and the um, and then transportation logistics, that could be framed as a reinforcement learning problem. These uh, spacesuits playing ping pong is a reinforcement learning problem, robots and stuff. A um, lot of applications. Um, and um, now, okay, so what are the challenges of reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is, 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 is one of the sort of, like it's, it's we're not, uh, this is fantastic, isn't it? Like I'll explain this in a second. Um, the the thing with reinforcement learning is that um, it's a hard problem. It's much harder than than computer vision, you know, learning uh, objects inside of images because um, the supervision is very, very. Um, the the supervision part is really muddled. So the problem. So when you do image classification, you get an image and you you know what the answer is, right? Um, and you train to get the answer right. But in reinforcement learning, what is the answer, right? Well, you're getting a reward, right? But how do you associate the reward with, um, with the action that you took? A reward signal is delayed, right? Um, so there's this problem of, of uh, what's called credit assignment uh, sometimes in, re in reinforcement learning, which means you can't easily um, associate an action that you took with the re with a reward that you obtained, like, or you can't figure out which action you took um, that that got you that that reward, and so that that makes the supervision part really difficult. Um, it's a dynamical system, so a dy dynamical system in in math means it's basically a system that's that's very very chaotic and and extremely um, like uh, the, it's very difficult to predict based on you know it can go in a completely different direction based on initial initial circumstances, right? And um, so early decisions greatly affect the far future. That's the, the chaos effect, right? Um, the credit assignment problem, as I, as I mentioned, the reward signal is delayed. So it's really, really difficult. And then um, this lack of high level information, what I mean by that is that uh, reinforcement learning agent, uh, reinforcement learning is very much concerned with making things, it's really sort of like, like trying to create general intelligence, right? Uh, we want to make things that can arbitrarily learn how to interact with a particular environment seeking some goal. And so researchers tend to sort of handcuff themselves by, by making the uh, representation of the world as general as possible. So there's no specific information, you know, so for, for example, if you're trying to train a video game, uh, trying to train an agent to play a video game, you don't want to program all of the sort of like the, the objects inside of that video game uh, because then it's like you have to do that for every single game. What you want is one of us, you know? You can just pick up any video game and basically learn how to play it really quickly. Um, and so the idea here is to basically represent everything in very abstract terms, including the reward itself uh, and the objective, 
and so so that everything can sort of fit into a reinforcement learning kind of uh, setup. Um, so again, like an example, just going from 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 this to a more specific version of this. Imagine, for example, that you're an agent. Here's you. It's not a not a particularly good hair day, but you know, that's you. You're you 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 shoot these whatever. I don't know. <laughs> what is this game? It's Breakout. I th uh, not Breakout. Space Invaders. Space Invaders. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, you're a spaceship, and you can you know shoot bullets, and you are receiving an observation from from an environment. The environment is in the Sari. Um, who knows what this is? Anybody? This is before any of our time, I think. Um, but uh, not by Jumanji? much. Sorry, Jumanji. <laughs> Jumanji. That, was that a game on the Atari? Yeah, it's a game that movie. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you receive an, a state observation. Here's the state. You're the agent. Here's the state, and you're receiving a reward, which is basically points, I guess. Um, and then you have a joystick. And so you can you have a few you have a limited set of options, and then depending on what you do with that joystick, you get a new observation of the state and a new reward, and then you know you have to learn how to navigate that space. Um, okay, so like how how might uh, deep learning uh, like um, well how might how might neural networks and deep learning kind of yeah? I'm sorry, but I'm so confused about the reward. Yeah. Um, so the agent's goal is to maximize the reward, right? Um, so it's receiving a reward and it's trying to figure out like how to how to take actions which will make it go as high as possible. And the reward depends on the context. So in this video game, it's points, right? But in in let's say um, it, it, let's say for like you're trying to train an agent to walk, its reward is not falling. So like how long it can go without falling, that could be a reward. Um, if you're an agent that's investing in the stock market, it's it's uh, profit, whatever. You know, there's all sorts of ways of framing a reward. Mm -hmm. So um, the way that this can be framed is that this this whole aspect, like basically um, environment to state to agent is it's kind of like a supervised learning scenario, right? You receive a state observation and you, uh, you know, pr classify, essentially. It's a classification of an action that you should take. So that might be framed like this, where you basically have a, and the observation is I like an image, let's say, like, like if it's in the video game, it's an image. And then that image is processed through a neural network and the neural network is basically telling you what, um, like, what is the, combination of keys to press in your joystick right so that's that's a that's the sort of supervised learning scenario and then this is framed inside of a what's called a q what's called q learning and q learning is basically trying to learn a um, like a decision process we're, we're not going to get too much into the details of this but you but often um, like the the way that this is constructed is that the agent is inside of a state space and can go from one cell in the state space to another cell and basically it does so by taking actions and so you have this kind of limited limited uh limited kind of graph in the sense that you could go from one one state to another something like that mm -hmm. yeah what are people using this for now are they using it to create a decision making process or are they testing different decision making processes to see like which ones the, this is kind of the decision making process is learned in this setup Okay. So, so that's, you create the front and the end, and then that happens yeah. through this. Mm -hmm. Always, uh, oh, yeah? So, like as a person, I guess the reward would be points, but then those points like mean like fun, or like they have some kind of meaning to them. And so I'm wondering, like, what through reinforcement learning, like how could you even make it do that? Like how do points mean anything? Mm -hmm. How do these different, I guess, how does an incentive mean anything? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's programmed to, to basically learn a policy which will maximize the reward, whatever that reward is. And so, you know, it's comparable to image classification where it's trying to, trying to not maximize but minimize a loss function. So it's, in that sense, it's, it's you know, it's a signal that we're trying to maximize. Mm -hmm. And, and we learn a policy to do so. 
Um, and by and I just mentioned policy. Policy is kind of the terminology that's used to describe the decision function. I should I should just say policy. You'll often hear that in reinforcement learning context. So um, one of the big um, <laughs> this is great. So let me just um, one of the big um, breakthroughs in this uh, recently has uh, so uh, one of the like the big player in reinforcement learning seems to be DeepMind. DeepMind is um, is a company that's you know stated aim is to is to figure out artificial general intelligence and they're owned by Google like everything else and DeepMind uh, although it's kind of interesting it's like it's now no longer owned by Google but it's a subsidiary of Alphabet mm -hmm. which is the which is the yeah it's the sort of parent company that Google made up yeah. I suppose to for various you know legal reasons mm -hmm. but um, but in any case DeepMind is is um, they're really really amazing a really strong company like in terms of the research talent they have, it's like out of out of control. It's like an all star team. They're like the Harlem Globetrotters, you know. Or, or, well, the, the, actually, the well, the Globetrotters aren't actually that good, right? Like they would lose to an NBA team, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe that's a bad bad. They're like they're they're the USA basketball team, like right? Team USA. Or I don't know, has Team USA kind of fallen a little in hard times? Like it's become there's more even. It used to be. It used to be like you know. Like in the eighties, it was just like like a, it was the dream team, right? It's like anyway. Um, so anyway, DeepMind has a lot of really crazy researchers, and they're studying the, um, reinforcement learning. And one of the big things that they did this was actually one of the first, I think, machine learning um, like uh, things to make Nature. And Nature is, is a very prestigious uh, journal for um, you know basically science and all that. And so this actually made it, you know computer science in in, in Nature. They trained um, an agent to play Atari games. Um, now, so so first of all, like at first when you hear that, that doesn't sound that uh, amazing, right? Like we we've been since our times we were kids. There's like we play against AIs in the video games, and you know those AIs like they're they're pretty good, right? Like so, what's so special about this? Um, well, what's special is how they how they made this work, right? So when you're playing um, a video game and there's an AI that's your adversary in it, um, everything about that game is programmed for that AI. Like it knows um, what all of the objects are and it knows what it's trying to do and it, and it, ha and it follows some simple uh, logic to, you know, like, like block you or whatever if you're trying to walk past it or, you know, the things, things like that. It's really simple. Um, but here, what they did is they um, they they want this joystick to play itself to 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 um, play an Atari game, and they constrain it in the following ways: the agent receives nothing except for raw screen pixels, um, so it's only seeing pixels. Nothing is told to it about this is the floor, this is the sky, this is the uh, these are the enemies, these are the you know, these are the blocks that you can grab. They're nothing, like zero, just pixels. And um, the the um, and and also like the objective of the game is not really specified either. There there is some kind of a like the reward signal is to win. That's it. Like there's no uh, like to you know every game has a way of winning, and so that's all the reward signal is. It's zero 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 until it wins and then one. So. Um, so it's extremely abstract, and of course, like the way that I just described, can every video game essentially can be framed that way? You receive screen pixels, and then you either win or you don't. <laughs> so um, basically, zero as as few assumptions as possible, and um, and so then they they start to train them using you know, you know, using using your normal sort of deep learning training procedures, and so this is what that looks like. Let's say you're trying to teach it to play pong. So here's here's the AI. It's in green. It's like okay, I don't know what what to do. Like that's what it, at first basically it just in the beginning it just takes random. It's just random actions, right? Because it's a neural network that's been initialized. It receives pixels and it produces some random classification, basically. So it just kind of stands there, wanders around, has no idea what's going on. But it's losing score very quickly, and so it's learning like, hey, standing around is not so good. Um, and so basically. You know, it starts to kind of figure out, hey, I can delay getting scored on if I kind of move around and like occasionally I might hit it and something good happens, right? And and, and again, all it's receiving is pixels. It doesn't know that this is itself, doesn't know that that's its adversary. 
another 500,000 uh, training grounds and it becomes competitive. Like with the, this is of course the simple AI. It has a program, you know, that says like, just follow the ball, right? And so this actually becomes competitive. And then after 10 hours, it's basically unbeatable. <laughs> totally unbeatable, right? Yeah. It's a wall. <laughs> yeah. I think this is sped up also, so I <laughs> think for some reason. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, they did the same thing with, with like, I don't remember how many, like some large number, like I don't know if whether it was 20 or 100 or whatever, but they, they trained like a large number of Atari games with the same algorithm, right? And you can see that all of the games have completely different scenarios. Like some of them have, so here you're trying to shoot things, here you're, you're trying to shoot things, here you're trying to... Um, this is breakout, right? Um, like it's it's a game where you have to you know hit the blocks. This is great. So check. So if you watch this, the one on the right, the breakout. Um, who's played a game like this, right? You know that like the the trick is to like build a tunnel and then it just like goes on top and oh, you know. Yeah. And so here, like it actually figures out to do this also oh, at some good. point later. Yeah, this is where it fi figures out to dig a hole. Yeah, see, it's really smart now. <laughs> We're all transfixed by this like little block that figures out. Yeah. So, um, so all of these games have very different rewards and very different objectives and so on. So it's really, it's really kind of neat in that sense. Um, then, yeah, this is these are agents that learn how to sumo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so their 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 reward is to not get thrown out of the ring. Stable. So they so they learn all these things. They learn like okay, you have to have a low center of gravity that makes you really good at sumo wrestling, I guess. Um, and then I don't know, you know, this is like <laughs> what that does, but yeah, fooling the opponent. Oh, here oh. they they fooled. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So these are all examples. This is some reinforcement learning in the real world. So this is a classic problem in reinforcement learning is balancing something on a on a you know like a like you're trying to balance something in your head like a pedestal or whatever. And so here it's trying to balance the rod. And so all it has is this thing that moves along this axis and it can, you know, swing the pole. And so its goal is to keep the pole up, right? So after a while it's like, it, you know, so it swings the pole for a while and then, you know, we can go, go through this a little bit. So after trial 29, let's see how it's good, how it's good doing. Not so well just yet. It's getting there. Look at that. Whoa. <laughs> One of the uh, like laws of science fiction is that any robot, if you put googly eyes on it, looks cute. Like so, if this thing, if you put eyes on it, you would you would empathize with it. I guarantee you. <laughs> um, this uh, oh look at that! It's learning how to what was this physics based character skills? Yeah, it's basically learning how to mimic uh, motions. So so you know you you give it a whole bunch of like you know people in body suits or whatever just. Um, like motions, then it learns to mimic them. So here it's learning to mimic a T-Rex, a lion, can learn how to do flips and stuff. It's really, really neat. Okay, so um, why do we have MCTS here? Wait, let me just see where I'm going with this. So Monte Carlo tree search, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna really quickly kind of, um, let's see, it's four o'clock, so yeah, we should, should do pretty well, okay. I'm going to quickly try to describe how um, a reinforcement learning agent in the abstract might work. And um, so for so a lot of um, so, you know, the agent has to make a decision and the decision leads to a new game state. And, you know, then in that new game state, the decision you have to make another decision and that leads to a new game state. So if you think of it, if you think about it, it's like a state space that's that's um, uh, what do you call it? Forking at every stage, right? So it's this, and it, and it branches out into many, many, many possible, not infinitely many, but, but, but very many 
um, you know, possible scenarios, right? And the, ag and the agent's goal is to follow one of these scenarios to, to such that it leads to the best outcome for the agent, right? Um, so one of the easiest contexts to, to uh, imagine this in is in something like Go, which, I, which I'll mention later. Um, how many people here are familiar with the whole AlphaGo story? Yeah. Is everybody here familiar with it? Um, if anybody's not familiar with it, uh, was that a no? Shaking? No. Oh, everybody? Okay. So um, I would uh, check out the AlphaGo movie on Netflix, actually. There's a, it's a very dramatic. Uh, it's a really great. But okay, so Go is this game, and I have slides about this later, but Go is a, it's a very ancient game that's basically been, uh, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of like the chess of the East. So it's really, it's not very popular in the West, but, but in China, Japan, Korea, Go is like, Go is, you know, it's the top game that you can play, basically. And, um, and Go is um, like the way, it, I have slides about this later, so I should really kind of leave this to that. But the point about Go that I want to make right now is that you can imagine that every, you know, you're, you're a player and you have to put down a piece on the board. And then at every, you know, at every point, you know, it's kind of like you're expanding the, all the game states that may possibly play out, right? And the amount of games that you can play out is unbelievably large. It's like it's a it's just a gigantic number, and so you can't possibly simulate all of them. And you have to figure out a policy that will you know give you the sort of optimal results of winning. Now, um, so this can be modeled uh, the, as a, as what's called a Monte Carlo tree search. So Monte Carlo tree search is an algorithm for for trying to um, basically search through trees, you know, and the trees are uh, this computer science uh, data structure, which can be used to model this evolving game state. And so Monte Carlo tree search is, you know, how do you search a tree seeking some objective? Like, let's say the objective is find the best branch of the, of the game that's uh, going to give you the highest reward or, you know, to win or whatever. So what is a policy for searching a tree, given that it's too large to, to search through all of it? Right, um, so you know you select a branch, you expand that branch, and then maybe you look for another. You know, you you always keep branching and following a path, right? Um, so the idea is that, um, with Monte Carlo tree search, of course, like you're there's all these um, trade offs. So let, let's let's imagine, for example, like a concrete scenario. Let's say we are playing tic tac toe. So in tic-tac-toe, the game state tree is not that large, right? There's, there's only so many, I think there's 700, something like that, possible tic-tac-toe games, something, something like that. Um, so, so then, okay, you're, let's say we're at this game state and we're trying to, we're X, we're, we're X, right? And so it's our move. And so, you know, there's all these possible X's that we can put down. There's five of them, right? Because there's five remaining squares, which one should we take? So this is kind of, there's like five branches here. And so one way that you might model this in the most simplistic way is you, um, you want to calculate which of these gives you the highest probability of winning. So maybe you can estimate it by just playing out a bunch of games and, you know, and then taking the average, like let's say you, know, you pick this branch and you play it out a bunch of, bunch of times, like you do 10 random playouts from here basically random, just exploring the branch randomly, and you find that, you know, four of the times you won and six of the times you lost. And then this one, you know, six of the times you won and four of the times you lost, right? And so you might go, okay, this one has a slightly higher probability, so I'm going to select this, right? So that's your Monte Carlo tree search. And then Monte Carlo, there's a formula for kind of figuring out exactly how many, you know, playouts you should do for each branch, you know how to select a branch to to do another play out there's there's a there's a complicated kind of process to it that is derived to you know maximally win a, a monte carlo tree search where there's no there's no machine learning here it's just kind of uh, playing playing things out right so here it just does a random play out figures out that it wins so you do this you count the number of wins and the number of iterations for each one you maybe do this for a little while and then yeah this is kind of the the, there's a this is the I forget what it's the Monte Carlo I forget the name of this formula but basically it's it's this this describes like the um, this is this is what is this I already forgot this is sort of the yeah like there's a score that for each of for each of the branches it's a score that tells you like how good this play out this how good this selection is and um, 
and yeah, you can kind of you can rederive this, but it makes sense basically. If you number of wins divided by ah, this also lets you balance between there's a problem uh, which is kind of the classic problem in reinforcement learning and machine learning is um, is uh, uh, shit, um, <laughs> multi multi -banded. It's like the um, exploitation versus versus uh, expansion. What is what am I? expansion versus exploitation? Basically, the the th trade off be between do you explore a game state more and more to learn more about it, or do you pick new random ones to learn that you don't know that much about? You know, so like you have to always kind of balance these two. Like, do you explore or do you or do you you know go into depth? Breadth versus depth, right? So this is kind of like the Monte Carlo tree search. So you could run this for something like tic tac toe, figure out an optimal policy for it. Now. Um, the, uh, and like Monte Carlo tree search works great for tic-tac-toe, but um, the problem for something like running it for chess, let's say, right? So if you try to run it for chess, your policy is just going to be terrible because the you can like you can only run so many playouts, right? If you run a random chess game, uh, you know, uh, like where everything is literally random, like the 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 pieces being put on the board, it's not a very good signal um, in terms of how good that branch is. It's random, right? Um, and, and there's so many that you'd have to try it, like the, the, the signal you're receiving is very weak. And so Monte Carlo tree search by itself does not scale to games which have a very, very large, uh, highly branching search space, right? And so, um, and so the way to improve Monte Carlo tree search for, for a game that has such a high search space is to basically not play out games all the way to the end, but try to estimate how good to basically stop somewhere and then have some figure out some estimate of how good it is at that point. Um, and then you can, um, you know, then you can search the space much better because, you know, random play out is like, there's just too many branches, right? So you want to kind of like, before you fork too many times, you just kind of estimate how good, how good it is. And that's sort of what chess players do, right? They analyze, they, they look at maybe, you know, they, they consider 10 moves. And they maybe play out both of those moves to just maybe two or three moves ahead. And then they look at, they consider the board position two or three moves from now, and they estimate, do I like this board position more or this board position more? It's not like they're playing out all the games all the way until the end. It's like, it's impractical. So that's kind of the idea of doing this for um, Monte Carlo Tree Search. So now, okay, so now we come to go. And this is this is one of my favorite things to talk about because, of course, it was like a really really big story. And so, does anyone here play Go? Any Go players? Yeah. Okay. What's your Don Don ranking? Right. It's like yeah, I have Don ranking. Oh, you don't have it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Is it hard? Um, right? Yeah. 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 It's pretty yes. hard. The, the the hard part is like you, there is no specific. The, the only rule is to actually um, occupy more space. On, on the uh, on the board, yeah. but the difficult part is to actually estimate what's the effect of your single move. It's gonna affect the whole right. situation yeah. Yeah. downwards because there's just too much. So basically, what you do is just do image recognition in your mind to say like this looks good to me. <laughs> that's that's what they're doing basically. Yeah. So uh, let me. I'll describe the rules really quickly for those who who don't know. Basically, you you there's two players. One has black pieces, one has white pieces, and you take and the, the board is empty in the beginning, uh, or no, you there's two put down, right? I forget actually. No, it's empty, right? Empty. So basically, you take turns putting down stones, and then uh, once you put a stone there, you can't move it. It's just it's not like chess where the pieces move around. You put down the stone and it's there, and then the goal is that you're trying to eat, you're trying to surround your opponent's stones with your stones to to gain territory or to surround empty areas. And you get points for the number of, of uh, spaces you occupy. So it's actually really, really simple in terms of the actual rules. Um, but the but the but the thing is, of course, like there's I there's just infinite complexity that emerges from that. And go, uh, we actually beat chess players 20 years ago. The best chess machines, uh, we we were already able to beat the number one chess player around 20 years ago. Um, that was the deep blue story with with Gary Kasparov. I'll mention that later. Uh, but but go only fell to the machines three years three or four years ago now, and so and the reason for that is because um, the search space of go is way larger than chess uh, and chess is already pretty large, 
but the search space of Go is really, really large. And so it's really difficult to, uh, to apply sort of Monte Carlo research type methods to, to, to beat Go. Um, and actually we're ahead of schedule. Like people thought we would take like another 10 years to beat Go. Um, so, okay, so this is, uh, this is the, I already mentioned this, the players take turns and they accumulate points by, by surrounding empty territories. Uh, this is the number of game states. tic tac toe boards, 765. Number of grains of sand on earth, that's an 18-digit number. Number of Planck times since the Big Bang, that's a 62-digit number. The number of atoms in the universe is an 80-digit number. Number of Go board, number of chess boards is a 120-digit number. Number of Go boards is a 170-digit number. So that means that this is not this is not twice as big as this. This is this is bigger than this by by uh, 90 orders of magnitude. So for every atom in the universe, there is the number of Go boards for each atom in the universe is a 90 digit number. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's pretty wild, right? So we can create like, you know, in our minds, these combinatorial games that are, whose properties are, are, you know, like basically incomparable with any physical, you know, that's why. So it's, that's why information is so interesting, right? Um, okay, so then, so basically the story was that in 2000, I, um, so AlphaGo was, was a uh, Go playing, is a Go playing um, AI that was developed by DeepMind and it started to gain some uh, results actually as far back as 2015. So it beat the European champion, uh, this guy Fan Hui, who's, who's, who's also like the kind of the narrator of the AlphaGo movie in Netflix. It was a really entertaining guy. Um, but anyway, um, the uh, the so yeah, no, the Fan Fan Hui is the he's the top European player, but but the, but he was ranked like seven hundredth in the world because basically like the top European player is seven hundredth in the world, <laughs> so uh, something like that. All the top players are are in are in East Asia. Um, then so Fan Hui said uh, very strong and stable seems like a wall I know alpha goes a computer but if no one told me maybe I would think the player was a little strange but a very strong player a real person um, so that was 2015 and then by 2016 it was it was playing against the top players um, so okay so how does alpha go work and this is this is really beautiful and and actually you should you should read the nature paper and and, and really in terms of the things that we've looked at it, it'll actually, it should make reasonable sense. Like basically it just uses convolutional neural networks plus Monte Carlo tree search. Boom, that's it. <laughs> so, okay, here's how it works. You, you receive a game, you have a game state and the game state is a board. It's a 19, think of it as an image. It's a 19 by 19 pixel image. And each pixel is, you know, has one of three states, white piece, black piece, or, or empty. And then a neural network is, there's two neural networks and they're each trying to evaluate two different things about it. There's a policy network and there's a value network. So um, the value network is straightforward. The, the value, what the value network is, is it tries to look at a game state and predict how good it is for, for you, for you, the what player, right? Um, and you can train it in a supervised learning scenario by basically taking millions of publicly known games and then um, taking every single game state and feeding the network like this network and this player won layer later or lost, mm -hmm. right? That's your supervised signal. And so then the network, the network can become pretty good at just estimating uh, how good a particular game state is. And what's interesting is that the, um, uh, oh, okay, so that, that's the value network, right? The policy network is a neural network that predicts what the next move would be. Also, it can be trained on actual games. So now your supervised signal is game state, predict next game state, right? What a human player would have played. And you know, there's there's publicly available games. You can just feed them uh, lots and lots of these you know games. And it turns out, by the way, the policy network by itself can actually play pretty well. It's like a decent AI that that could play like and beat most amateur players just by itself. So, uh, but things get really great when you combine the policy network and the value network, right? So policy network, predict the next move, value network, estimate how good that game state is. And so using the policy and the value networks together, you can do a Monte Carlo tree search where you, where you very 
serious. So like the, the, the policy network essentially eliminates most of the breadth of your search. It gets rid of, it just says, okay, all of these moves, like let's not even consider them because they have a very low probability of being played. Um, and then we'll just consider the smaller subset of moves and we can play them out a little bit and use the value network to, to predict for us like how good that game state is uh, without having to play it out randomly all the way to the end, right? So, so that's, that's the way that it, it works in the beginning. Basically, they trained it on, AlphaGo was trained on many, many million, I don't know how, however, maybe hundreds of thousands or whatever, however many games they have in the database. And it learned a policy network and a value network. And then that, in, uh, inside of a Monte Carlo tree search, learns to play Go pretty effectively. Now here's where things get really crazy. Then they it gets pretty good doing that. It can com it can compete by that point with with like most good human players, um, but it's still not as good as like top Go professionals. And so then they have this um, brilliant reinforcement learning um, uh, setup where um, where basically it gets better through self play. Um, and what that means is that you make a copy of the network, you have two copies of it, and they play against each other forever. Uh, not, not forever, but like, you know, overnight while you're sleeping. And then basically uh, uh, fine-tuning the, the policy and the value networks based on which of them wins. So both of them, you know, might, might make, you know, some changes to their policy and value. Whichever one wins, you keep those uh, changes. And so this self-play thing is used to... They, they bootstrap from a, from a supervised learning scenario based on real games that humans have played. And then it gets better and better and better through self-play. And then at that point, it's able to challenge the world's best player who just announced his retirement last week, by the way. This is also very timely. He just announced his retirement. And he said, he said the reason why he's retiring is because, is because of AI. Like, I'm not even kidding. Wow. He's like... He's like, the, the fact that there is an entity that can play better, it, it means that there's no more reason for me to play. It's really, really crazy, yeah. Yeah, he's a really intense dude. So anyway, he, he said, uh, and I really like this, I will do my best to play a beautiful, interesting game. One of the things uh, that's interesting about Go is that, like, the players often talk about them in very sort of, like, poetic, kind of artistic terms because it feels like um, the, the game is, like, like the Go is... There's kind of like like chess is a much more it feels like an analytical game because you know you the the pieces are constrained in how they can move. There's all these like different heuristics that you can use to figure out like okay I want my pieces to be covering each other and I, there's all these analytics you could use. But with Go it's like there's so much like intuition basically like the players have to just kind of like look at like exactly what you said you just look and you just kind of like i like this better you know and then they and then you know there's some kind of analytics going on inside but but they're i feel like they're they're not computing as much they're kind of like it's everything's much more intuitive and so you hear this kind of like games can look interesting or beautiful you know the the positions that they have and so on and so AlphaGo. Uh, was basically against the human species. This was a really, you know, like the big sort of game and AlphaGo beat Lisa Dahl four to one. Um, Lisa Dahl from Korea was playing, played in Korea and this was a huge blow to humans. However, Lee won in game four. Uh, so he did, he did manage to take one from AlphaGo and that was like the, the movie when, when this happens, it's like basically the redemption of the human species. Apparently, apparently he, uh, he used some kind of an experimental strategy which made AlphaGo delusional. That's what they called it. This is really great. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's the idea of Alpha. Now, okay, so then AlphaGo Zero came. Now, AlphaGo Zero is where things get even crazier. So this this is when most people stop paying attention actually, because once the big AlphaGo thing happened, that was it, right? But they keep on developing it, and then AlphaGo Zero came out sometime later, and AlphaGo Zero is even better than AlphaGo. And the way AlphaGo Zero works is that it, it's a few a few uh, additions to this. One is that now there instead of having um, instead of having uh, two neural networks like a policy and a value network, there's just one. They're combined into one net network. And the idea there is to kind of again like you want to simplify your assumptions so that you can scale to other kinds of games. Then uh, they 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 did have some handcrafted features. I can't remember what they were. Um, but they, they like like instead of learning everything just from pixels, there was some 
some specific um, specific things that they programmed into it. So they got rid of those. And then this is the craziest thing. They got rid of the training data. So um, like basically, instead of, tr instead of bootstrapping the system from a data set of human played games, they, um, they, they just started through self play alone. So the game, so basically they just start with two AlphaGo zeros. That's why it's called zero, it has no knowledge in first. Both of them play completely randomly, totally randomly. And then it's kind of like, again, a little bit like, you know, the generator and the discriminator, they're both stupid in the beginning and then they just like get better and better and better. And, um, and after 40 days of training and what is this? 30 million. I don't know. 30 million something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. 30 million. I think 30 million games, probably 30 million games. It was able to beat AlphaGo. So then AlphaGo zero against AlphaGo. So this is where it's like, you know, like it's just getting crazy. Right. And then um, Lisa Dahl actually wasn't, he wasn't number one in the world. He was number two. He's kind of like the most decorated player ever. So he's, uh, but actually the top player is this guy K KG who's number one in the world. And then, and then AlphaGo zero beat, beat, beat KG and was 60 and zero against top humans online. And, um, and yeah, it's just kind of crazy stuff. And this is how slow it learns. So this is the, the green is AlphaGo that played against um, Lisa Dahl. And then it gets better than that. And then it gets even better than AlphaGo. I forget what AlphaGo Master was. I think maybe that was just the first two of these. But anyway, yeah, it's just crazy stuff. Um, and uh, the whole thing with zero learning is, is really interesting because, um, you know, it tabula rosa, that means blank slate, right? And alpha zero, alpha go zero it starts from a blank slate and, and it's not trained on human games. So there's a couple of interesting things about that. One is that, first of all, it's amazing that it works, right? Because a training process like that should be so unstable, right? Because you're getting such a weak signal in the beginning. The games are totally random, but somehow it works. But what's more interesting about it is that it means that it's that we can watch it learn. And, and it really tells us maybe a lot about the games that we are still studying to this day, you know, it's like we've crafted the game, but we still don't understand it. So AlphaGo Zero begins to rediscover strategies that humans figured out hundreds of years ago, let's say. Um, but then it begins to even discard those strategies and create new ones. And so this is where things get like really, really, really interesting. And this is a really great quote that I really like from from a Russian chess player named Viktor Korchnoi. I don't study, I create. So I think this is kind of like really encapsulates the whole thing. So then AlphaGo Zero was then branched into a project called Alpha Zero. And the goal of Alpha Zero was one, again, one algorithm, which can do this, this same thing, except do it for different games. So uh, Alpha Zero was then, was then generalized to Go, uh, Shogi, um, and chess. And um, who plays, does anyone here play Shogi? It's like, a, I think it's, it's, a, it's like a Japanese chess, yeah. It's like Japanese chess, basically. Um, and, and then chess, right? And uh, I'm a big chess fan. I grew up playing chess a little bit until I stopped because it was just too stressful. Um, <laughs> but um, Alpha Zero, Alpha Zero, this is, and this is, I'm gonna have to geek out a little bit on chess for you. Alpha, the best chess engine in the world is called Stockfish. And, and, and first of all, chess fell to the machines 20 years ago. So like 20 years ago, the, the computers that we built, those, you know, like IBM Watson was able to beat uh, Gary Kasparov at chess. So the chess engines since then have just gotten, they're so unplayable that, that like there's no more human versus chess competition. The top grandmasters don't play against, mm -hmm. against chess engines. It's pointless. They're, it's absolutely unbeatable. Um, and so Stockfish, for example, is this like commercially made software that's a chess engine that no human could beat. And, ch and chess grandmasters, all pretty much all of them now, use Stockfish to train with it. Um, so you actually use it to train. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I just wonder, like, I remember when I was playing chess game online, there's level that you can choose, like difficult, normal, easy. Um, how does those level works? Uh, um, well, oh, I, I, oh, for, for like a stockfish or something like that. Yeah. I think you know. I mean, I, don't, I don't know exactly. They're, they're, you know, they are actually, you know, some kind of a, you know, like old school machine learning thing. And you know, if you don't train it for as long, it's not as good. Or, or I guess maybe they're constrained. So, like the way that, like for example, 
a chess engine works is that it also has to evaluate game states. And so you can just limit how many game states it's allowed to evaluate. You know, you give it less time, and so then it produces a worse decision. Yeah, I, th I think that's kind of more or less how it does. Um, in any case, like the way st something like Stockfish has made is, uh, and by the way, there's like a yearly um, competition between engines. So this is like, you know, alien chess. It's like Stockfish <laughs> versus Komodo. You know, Komodo is another engine. And, you know, it's like they're playing in ways that humans can't even, you know, they, they just can't even comprehend. Um, and and um, so then chess, uh, so Stockfish, you know, it's programmed by tons of grandmasters. And, they, and it's basically a Monte Carlo tree search plus a value, uh, plus like a policy and a value network except it's not a it's not a it's not a neural network it's actually going to be some 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 like expertly crafted function which evaluates the board so it'll do things like count how many of the pieces are in check you know how you know like it, it, all these heuristics like the things that grandmasters think about you know they actually program into stockfish so it takes a lot of engineering to program it and then it becomes you know the best chess player in the world but it takes a lot of effort to do it, and then it doesn't work for anything other than chess. And so this is why Alpha Zero is so interesting, because not only is it better than Stockfish, but it does so without expert programming, right? It does so without grandmasters. It, it's just, and it generalizes to other games. And so that's really crazy. And so, like I said, like chess fell to the machines in 97, and uh, the top chess engine is would be 500 points above the top ranked uh, player in the world today, who is Magnus Carlsen. This is some, um, this is when Kasparov was losing to, to Deep Blue. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically IBM Deep Blue was Monte Carlo Tree Search plus a very complex handcrafted function, more or less the, the, the value network made by dozens of chess masters, which estimated the value of position to the player. There's all these other uh, engines, Komodo, Ribka, all that, and they're, they're super crazy. Um, and then Alpha Zero came along, and in chess there's a lot of draws, so draws are quite common. So Alpha Zero, 28 no against Stockfish with 72 draws, and you know Stockfish like again like when first of all like you watch like players love watching Stockfish lose because you know it's like it's the thing that's always beating you, and so like to watch Stockfish getting d dismantled by by Alpha zero was really crazy and i just really like to i want to show this really quickly just because this is me really geeking out this is uh first of all there's a chess channel called a god mator and this is like i watch this every day it's like if you've ever seen my youtube recommendations it's all just <laughs> videos from from this guy um and he analyzes chess games and and in a very entertaining way and he analyzed one of the games from deep mind uh from uh alpha zero and stockfish and this is an actual position that that deep that Alpha Zero had Stockfish in, and this is what's called. This is a, one of the pinnacles of chess is to get a Zugzwang, and a Zugzwang is a position in which your opponent cannot uh, basically doesn't want to move any of their pieces because every possible legal move that they can take ruins their position. <laughs> so here, like the king can't move, the queen can't move, neither of these rooks can move be, uh, because then the, this pawn goes and then it's going to be checkmate. Um, they, they, like like this this can move, but then it just then it, then this also becomes checkmate. These pawns can move, but then they just get eaten, and then it doesn't solve the problem. It's like it's really crazy to see like you know the handcuffing of stockfish. It's like it's it's really it's really something. I would really recommend for any of you chess freaks out there. Uh, and they in the journal paper they talked about how Alpha Zero rediscovers uh, classical openings in chess. And then it begins to play them less. As it learns, it begins to get rid of them. It's like, you know what, the French defense, we saw how that worked. You know, just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, and so it begins to play that a lot less. And um, yeah, what is, what's going on? Oh, there's like, it's just crazy off the board. Oh yeah, this is like, some of the, like the moves that, that um, Stockfish takes are just like, really ra or sorry the alpha go uh, alpha zero takes are super radical so okay now um they're trying to apply this to more complex games like video games with screen pixels and these actually are way harder because now you're dealing with a game state that you can't see the whole thing anymore and there's you know there's maybe a very very sort of like a lot of dynamics to it and so this is kind of the frontier 
And for example, DeepMind has been training um, in AI to play against the world's top Dota, Dota 2 players. Any Dota 2 players out here? Defense of the Arts, I think it stands for. I'm not a big gamer, but I know this is like a super, super, uh, you know, popular game. And it's a team game and there's, there's all this team strategy. And um, apparently DeepMind is, and oh, by the way, like there's all professional gaming. It's like you can make a living, like, I mean, not a lot of people, I don't think, but you can make a living as a professional game player and they play in the arenas and stuff. It's like really, really, um, really crazy. But anyway, the top players are getting beaten by DeepMind again under limited circumstances. I think they constrain the games in certain ways that, that make it easier. But, but, you know, we're approaching the complexity that, that games like this um, have. Um, I'll show you a few more things and then we'll take a quick break. Uh, I want to I want to show you just a few more like cool things in the realm of supervised learning that might pique, pique people's curiosity. I don't have enough time to talk about them in much detail, but it's but I have the links here. So if anyone's interested, this is some cool work um, by um, I forget where this came out of. I think it's in the university. But basically, like uh, here is a reinforcement learning, uh, which is drip where the reward signal is not winning the game, but basically uh, some some notion of curiosity. So the agent's re or a goal is to is to just you know satiate their curiosity, and so they uh, they they go through different game states and you know they explore, and so this is kind of like very wholesome. You know, it's just <laughs> sort of like curiosity driven um, exploration. Um, there is code for online for basically building your own alpha zero, uh, which is really cool. Um, you know, every single, um, I think that the, it uses the um, connect four as instead of uh, instead of uh, go, because go would be a little bit computationally heavy. So they use connect zero, uh, connect four, which is this game where you have to connect four dots in a row. And so they there's code for doing this um, in, I think, using Keras. So that's that's really cool. This is maybe a little old by now, so I'm not there might be stuff that's already more up to date, but it's definitely worth checking out. And then OpenAI has a lot of resources for reinforcement learning. They have this gym. I think I have a slide on that, um, where they basically um, this is this is um, they they have this whole environment that you can that 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 has an emulator for a whole bunch of games, and they make it super easy to like start coding for reinforcement learning. They have this whole environment that has a list of games that you can play and an interface for working with all of them. So there's just kind of a lot of like really useful stuff there. And then they have this open AI gym, which is, which is that's actually what I was referring to as open AI gym. It's just a whole bunch of games um, and then interfaces to those games. So it's a really easy way to plug in and begin to kind of like train reinforcement learning agents to play these games um, for which they have a lot of tools for. So it's really a lot of cool stuff. And that's where the, actually the, the screenshot of my, my first picture came from. Then there's these agents, uh, Unity agents. I think a few people have been using that here. Um, Aiden Nelson, who was in my, my class last year, he uh, used this in his in his final. So for those of you doing stuff in agents, uh, Unity, there's a, there's this machine learning, reinforcement learning agents environment for Unity, which is super, super awesome. And um, yeah, that's it. So okay, let's take a quick break. And then after the break, we're going to do a tutorial on Glow. So you could do fun stuff like this. Um, and then I'm gonna explain Abraham, and then we'll be we'll be done. So uh, yeah, let's take a quick break. So what I want to do now is um, take you through a new notebook, actually, that I just that I just finished putting online today. So it might be a little bit rough around the edges, but but it, it should be pretty usable. And um, you uh, feel free to follow along if you want to. You don't necessarily have to. It's it's easy enough to trace the steps um, once you're, um, you know, once we're done with this class. Obviously it's being recorded, but also it's a notebook, so you can kind of step through it. And I, I should be adding more documentation to it a little later. It's a little sparse in the documentation, so, um, but it, it should be more or less readable. So if you go to the guide section of mlfraid.github.io, you will see that there is a new guide down here, which has a bunch of versions of Obama's face. Um, and that is over here. So if you click into that, it'll take you to Colab and this same drill. Um, actually, let me place this into, I have to be signed in, so. So you should receive something like this. <coughs> oh, 
excuse me. And and as before, uh, as with the other notebooks, you'll you'll want to click um, uh, open in playground and then make a copy of it so that w w once you have a copy of it, you can you know make changes to your version. Um, I'll be probably updating my version in time, and so you may you know you might want to switch back at some point, but but that's you know it's for you to decide. Um, okay, so first of all, what is Glow? Um, um, okay, you'll see this uh, in in OpenAI's blog. They wrote about this a little while ago. Um, better reversible generative models, uh, and what, what this basically means is, um, it, okay, so Glow. One of the problems with generative models is that, you know, it, it, with something like a GAN, let's say, you um, when you have a when you train a GAN, it can produce images, right? But then um, we might be interested in being able to uh, start instead of making a random image, we'd like to start with a specific image, right? And with GANs, there's no mechanism built into it that lets you uh, project an image into the GAN in order to find its latent representation that generates that same image. If we could be able to do that, we would be able to uh, use arbitrary images that we select inside of these generative models instead of just you know using synthetic ones all the time. And so this is a problem in generative models in general, and it's even a problem in autoencoders, even though autoencoders do have a mechanism for projecting an image back into the latent space, but it's an imperfect one. So the the if you try to you know encode the image, you won't get the exact same representation from the decoder uh, as you as you put into the encoder. And so Glow is this model by OpenAI that's in the f uh, that's part of a family of what are called flow-based models, and the these basically use these invertible convolutions. Invertible just means that you can go back to you know you can rederive the original input. Right, so you can't do that with a GAN. You, it, when you throw in some Z vector into a GAN and it produces an image, you can't, like, you know what Z vector produced that image, but you couldn't, if you were given an image, you couldn't figure out which Z vector produced it. Um, not, not directly anyway. I mean, there's ways of trying to estimate it, and which, which work, like, not that well, but, you know, reasonably. reasonably. Glow is actually a model where you can just go back and forth in and out of the latent space uh, between images and latent codes. Um, the, it, there's a heavy price though, which is that the latent space is, is basically as big as, the, as big as pixel space. So usually you know in the generator uh, in the, in, you know like in stylegan, for example, you have your latent space is 512 numbers, which is already a, lar a large number. Um, you know there, it, it's as many as um, that it's it's a large number, but you as you modulate that number, you get you get a way more pixels out of it. And in Glow, the uh, the latent space is I think uh, nineteen. What is it? One hundred ninety thousand, roughly. So it's way larger, and so that's kind of the cost that you pay. Uh, that that comes with it, some of its own disadvantages. The latent space is not very compact. It's like it's it's got a lot of regions that are not. You know, it's hard to find stuff in it because it's very large. Um, nevertheless, it, it it does have this really awesome property of being able to encode images. So they showed kind of like what they could do with it. So here they they this is a face of somebody, like an actual person. I think I think it's a celebrity, maybe I don't know. Um, but anyway, like you can do the, this kind of stuff where you okay, how much do you want this image to smile? So you control the smile. <laughs> You can control the age. You can make the eyes more narrow, more or less narrow. I, I interpret it as you wish. <laughs> um, give it a beard. Um, so okay, so like interesting stuff like that. They, c you can, um, yeah, this is the researcher who worked on it, I think Dirk, uh, Dirk uh, Kingma. So yeah, doing all these like manipulations. Um, 
So it's useful for lots of different things, um, but it's also really fun to play with. And so we're going to show how to play with it. Uh, the, the glow is really difficult to train. Um, it's one of these models where maybe it's gotten easier, but I remember uh, I think the stats on how much they had to train it were you know absolutely obscene. And so, um, however, they did make a pre-trained model available that was trained on faces. It'd be really awesome to train this in something besides for faces, uh, but this only works for faces basically. So uh, if you want to follow along, I want you to run the first cell. So this is going to do a whole bunch of stuff and it's going to take a, like a minute or two. So uh, hit the play button and what it's doing is it's, it's, down, it's cloning my, um, my fork of the Glow repository, which, which is uh, forked from OpenAI's. Uh, the reason why we're using mine is because I have this demo, some demo functions that we basically use to make this a little bit more convenient. So that's going to be there. And then also it's just declaring a whole bunch of functions that will let us download images from the, from the web, align their faces, you know, do, do all the stuff that, that we want to do with Glow. So this is all the sort of our API. And so uh, this should take a moment. So it's cloning it and then it's going to download a whole bunch of stuff. It's downloading the model and it's downloading a whole bunch of vectors. Um, which correspond to the tags that we can work with. And so just let that do its thing. In the meantime, I'm going to quickly, um, since this is rendered, I can make a little bit of space in my computer. Quickly stop this. Okay, so you see it's still running. So this takes a little while. Um, downloaded the model. Once this stops for everybody, um, how many people are following along? Okay, like a hand, most of you. Okay, so basically like at some point this will this should terminate. It's doing a whole bunch of stuff. The main thing that takes a while is is downloading these things. So these are basically the both. The, the, this is basically the model. There's two models actually. Actually, I only need to download one because I'm only using one. But okay, it downloads both, and then it's downloading these um, Z manipulate, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, and then um, a face model also because we use that to extract faces. Um, that's a good question. I, I think you can find out in the original like paper or blog post. Uh, I think I want to say that they probably used one of the big publicly available data sets like either labeled faces in the wild, which is like some some several hundred thousand or something like that. Or maybe it's even in the millions. Um, it's something in along that order of magnitude. Um, we have plenty of faces in our data, that's for sure. Okay, so mine is done. Um, it should, the last thing you should see is warm started FTF model. Um, so who sees that? Everyone's still waiting? Okay, so probably all of you should be done. Yours done, okay. So you, a few of you should be done. So while, while waiting, let me describe, you know, while yours is still finishing up, I'll describe the first cell. So the API that we're gonna use is um, this starts with with um, downloading an image from the from the web and then making a square uh, making a square alignment of it. So if you like, this is the URL I found an image of Obama. You know, why not? And that's this one. I think it's his presidential portrait. And then it this whole process will actually download it. This get face picture downloads an image from the URL, and then there's a method called get face aligned, which we declared up top, which will take a, a cropped square with the eyes uh, horizontal. So it'll actually rotate the image slightly to make sure that the eyes are horizontal. It basically square centers the, the face. Um, and the reason why it does that is because that's how Glow is trained. Everything is like perfect, perfect square alignment. Um, now, um, if, if it doesn't find, um, like sometimes people put in an image that, that's a little challenging to find the face inside of. And if you don't get one, it'll, it'll just, it should print out an error that didn't find the face. Um, if that happens, just try another image. Uh, but yeah, just try searching for this. Now, uh, another thing is if you want to do this differently, like for example, um, if this is just a NumPy array. And so if you know how to produce, uh, turn an image into a NumPy array, you could do this differently. But just for convenience sake, I'm using this URL system. Um, so if you want to use a different face, I would encourage you to like, you know, why, like just instead of I'm gonna be well, why don't I just do it also like, uh, um, oops. Uh, okay, let's let's pick. Uh, who am I gonna use for? Who? Hillary. 
That's too boring. It's, it's, I just did Obama. We gotta. <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried. It works really well with with frontal facing. You know, like the more standard your image is, the better it tends to be. Uh, let's see here if I. Sometimes, like in search engines, you'll get you'll get kind of weird things. But okay, um, let's do this. URL equals this, and let's see if it finds Gilbert Godfrey's face. No, invalid URL. Oh, make sure that your URL is not invalid. So keep those HTTPSs in there. There we go. Not bad. All right, well, let's check this out. So, okay, so the first thing to understand is that there's two important functions here, encode and decode. Encode takes an image, like the one that we just got, and gets a, represent a, a latent code which produces that image in, in Glow. So if we do Z equals encode aligned image, we get this 196,000 dimensional latent input vector. And that latent input vector, when it goes into Glow, it produces this exact image. So this is really crazy. It's a generative model which contains every possible image in it, right? So the re so it, every possible, including possible, like the, here's the thing: the, you you can even put in like an image of a dog, and it will produce that exact same image, right? And you go, oh, I can do I can do operations on every possible image, but it doesn't actually end up working that way because as soon as like to, to get an image of something that's not a face, you have to go way out into some part of the latent space which is sparsely populated. And so everything around it is going to be mush. Right? So I try to do like interpolations between a dog and a cat or something and, and it, it doesn't actually work that well. But, um, but yeah, you can re recreate any image. So this, this looks like it's... Um, so okay, so if I run this, it's going to... What it does is it you know, encode the image into a variable called z and then we take z and we can decode it and decode it brings it back into a into an image and the image is going to look exactly the same as this but it's not the same this is downloaded from the internet and this is generated by glow right so that's kind of an important distinction so can i ask a question it, so it um, encodes the image into the variable z yep by passing it through the latent by passing it through a, a like so this this um, this network takes uh, it, it basically can propagate either way through it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And we're at the other end. Right now. Yeah, we we go either and from Z it. from Z to X yeah. or from X to Z. Yeah. And so every there's always a you know there's a pair between every between that for every possible image. So okay, so we regenerated uh, this Z. Right. Oh, sorry. We regenerate the image of Z, but what if we do things with Z? Like, what we can make changes to Z and then see what happens. So here, for in, for instance, in this first cell, we just create a Z add, which is which is this creates a vector, a random vector, which is uh, a random normal vector. So that means that it's it's a random it's a normal distribution centered at zero and and standard deviation of one, and it makes it the same size as Z. So that we create this vector z add, and then we have the new variable z new, where we take z, and and this is really just doing z plus 0 0.3 times z add, right? So we add 0 0.3 of it. That's and and then we can decode from z new and and generate that, right? Now what the, what this does in the this is a little I suppose this is a little like like let me just do this really quickly. I'll I'll com comment this out. And then with z new, I could do what we did before. We could do decode z new, and that gives us a new image. And then we can display the image like this, display image. Now there's one important thing this is going to, uh, just to note, you actually have to do image 
zero. And I'll, I'll, the reason for that, and I, I wanna make sure I got that right, let me just see. Uh, the reason why it's zero is because, yeah, there it is. Uh, so it's not that different actually, didn't, we didn't make much of a change. We can make a bigger change. So like if I made this 2.3, it's probably gonna be mush. Um, yeah, <laughs> so don't go too far um, in in the random direction, right? So this is kind of the the so this this is kind of a, a disadvantage compared to like a a normal uh, like a style gan or something. In style gan, you can go all over the place and you get and get realistic looking images. But in glow, the price you pay for perfect invertibility is that most of the latent space is junk. So, um, but somewhere in that latent space is Gilbert Gottfried. Like somewhere, and somewhere in that latent space is you, like, it, it, and, and not only you, but every picture of you that's ever existed. So that's kind of a that's kind of a neat thing. Um, now, so the yeah. reason we put a zero there is it because it's a list of some sort. The zero uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so this actually decoding uh, uh, gener it takes a batch okay. of Z's. It just happens to be that this batch has a length of one. And so we're taking the first out of one elements. The point is that Z could actually be, instead of one vector, it could be 10. And then you, and then you, can, um, you can send them all to decode and get 10 images back and then they'd be indexed by 10. Um, and, and so that's just, so yeah, that's kind of the, um, that's, that's what happens there. So this, this next block of code, what it does is actually just makes it just makes a. Uh, it does this for three or four, uh, five values of of amount zero point two five point five, and then it displays all of them. And so you could see like what happens as we move in a random direction. You know we you know it just basically becomes less and less of a face. So okay, so that's not so interesting, right? But the point is that that uh, many uh, most possible directions that you go in are not meaningful. They will do some random chaotic operation, um, which turns the thing into mush. However, there are certain vectors which basically, if you go in that direction, they make changes to what um, they make changes to the uh, image that are I interesting. So one one thing you could do is imagine imagine for example that you took a thousand faces that had beards. And then you took a thousand faces that didn't have beards, right? So you have these, this data set of a thousand beards and a thousand non-beards. And then you took all of the thousand beards and you encoded them through Glow. And then you took all their Z vectors and you averaged them together. And then you get some, some centroid that, uh, between all of the images that have beards. And then you, take, you do the same thing with all the images that don't have beards. You take the centroid of all those images. Then the vector between them is basically a bearding vector. It's the vector that will add or subtract a beard, right? And this can be done with any possible attribute, right? As long as you find it, you have to find it first, right? So if there's a particular attribute that you're looking for, you could, you could find it using a process like this. And I think maybe someone wrote some code for this that kind of does this nicely, but it's pretty simple strategy, more or less, like if you think about it. Um, so, um, so okay. So now OpenAI happens to have done this already for us. They 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 found a bunch of known attribute vectors, and th those are inside of a a NumPy array uh, called Z Manipulate. And these are the known attributes: five o'clock shadow, arched eyebrows, attractive. That's uh, it's gonna be an interesting one, right? Bags under eyes, bald, bangs. Big lips, big nose, black hair, blonde hair, blurry, blurry, like <laughs> brown hair, bushy eyebrows, chubby, double chin, eyeglasses, goatee, gray hair, heavy makeup, that's one of my favorites, um, high cheekbones, male, so uh, ma male, s a mouth slightly open, mustache, narrow eyes, no beard, oval face, pale skin, pointy nose, receding hairline, um, Rosy cheeks, sideburns, smiling, straight hair, wavy hair, wear, wearing earrings, wearing hat, wearing lipstick, wearing necklace, wearing necktie, young. Uh, and actually, I, I should mention um, 
Uh, I'll mention this in a second about the young. There's an actual error there. So first of all, all of these show how to make more of, of each attribute, but also less. So if you go in the opposite direction, these are all vectors, right? They go in the direction that makes more of this. More of the five o'clock shadow means add this vector to wherever you are and you get more five o'clock shadow. And um, so, which means that you can go in the opposite direction too. So for example, you can go more female by subtracting the male vector. Oops. Um, Uh, you'll see in a minute because I have the example. Um, then and same thing and then same thing for young and old. It's just that there's bidirectional, so you can go younger, older. However, this is a little confusing. Uh, I think OpenAI has it mislabeled. Young is actually old. I've noticed that when you go in the positive direction with young, it actually makes it look older, and when you go um, in the negative direction, it makes it, so I think they mislabeled it. Um, so just keep that in mind. So okay, so how does this work? You can get that vector for each attribute from looking it up. It's a hash map. It's, it's so basically you, oops, it's a map. So basically it, it has an index and you can get the index um, using tags that index of the tag. So this basically you, this will give you the blonde hair vector and then add attribute. It's the same as in the last cell Z plus the blonde hair vector times 1.25. So that gives us a Z blonde and an image blonde gets decoded from Z blonde, and then we display it. And then I have a title also. So I did this just in the example, I did it with blonde hair, goatee, uh, female, which is minus male, uh, smiling, eyeglasses, old, which is minus young, although actually it's in reverse. Like I said, it's weird. And then young, which is the other way around. And then what's going on here? It's just random. Um, so let's try that. So this is for Obama. So here's blonde Obama. Goatee Obama, female Obama, <laughs> um, smiling Obama, that's great, <laughs> it's just really, um, eyeglasses Obama, dropping the mic, I'd say, young Obama, look it made his hair like black, um, so yeah this, this actually, yeah subtract young it actually makes it look younger. And then add young actually makes it look older. So there's old Obama. Um, I don't know. We can try like these other ones with Gilbert Gottfried. But let's let's see what happens if we do this for Gilbert Gottfried. And then maybe like, I don't know, if there, like some of these, like I haven't really, some of them don't work that well. The eyeglasses, look, look really the eyeglasses one looks, looks really good, I think. But um, I don't know. We can try like the, like um, wearing, uh, Wearing lipstick. I want to try wearing lipstick. So, oh, uh, first of all, that's <laughs> smiling. And it gives them lipstick. That's interesting. Um, so, wait, wait. So, here's blonde Gilbert Gottfried. It's pretty good. <laughs> Goatee Gilbert Gottfried. Um, female Gilbert Gottfried. That looks really good, right? I feel like it's um, smiling Gilbert Gottfried. He was already smiling, so. Uh, glasses and the young old that's pretty good right um, and then uh, I want to do this like wearing neck wearing lipstick I want to see how that looks well, we'll put that wearing lipstick so that will just go into the last cell So you'll notice like the wearing lipstick also makes him look more female. So this is kind of the uh, sampling bias effect, right? There's like uh, more of the pictures that have lipstick are women. And so so then, then there's a conflation of different features. And so you can't quite, you know, if, if your strategy is to simply isolate images that have the attribute that you desire, well, they have other attributes as well. And so you'll see that there's a, that the, Attributes are not independently distributed. That's a general rule of thumb in, the, in, in the statistics. So let me get rid of that. <laughs> it's mislabeled, so it's just uh, young. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. Another thing that you can do is you can make an interpolation. So if you have a list of Zs, you can place them into a, a list here. And then, and then this function make interpolation video 
will grab this list and then and then place make 20 frames transition uh, this many frames basically 20 in this case 20 frames transitioning between each of them and then it'll make a video with this name so let's make a uh, god free interpolations and um, this takes a little while because now it's going to generate um, you know however many this is three four five six seven so seven times twenty it's going to be a hundred and um, forty frames 160 actually because it'll go um, to the to the uh, it'll loop around to the begin to the beginning and so now it's making 160 images and then it'll generate a video called Godfrey interpolations that MOV on the server and then you can download it using files that download uh, what not connected. Oh, uh, I got I got disconnected, so I think probably I have to start from the beginning. Did anyone get disconnected? This will happen when a lot of us are using using the notebook in one place. Like Google will kick you out. Um, so yeah, you you do you just um, yeah, I think I think um, you know the thing is I feel like it doesn't have to actually redo all this. Um, I'm actually having trouble allocating. I think it's the internet. Really? Do we have? Well, I just got something saying you're not connected to the internet. Oh yeah, we're not connected to the internet, are we? Cool. Is everyone disconnected? Yeah. How often does that happen? Yeah, right. Usually, Usually maybe, maybe you have to. Okay, fine. Yeah, is it back? <laughs> Let me try. Not for me, it is. Okay. Okay, well, if the internet's not working, I can't really do this notebook right now. So maybe maybe the next step is, if it's not about to turn on right away, I can just go, go to my lecture and come back. Yeah, should we do that? This does not seem... I hate doing things in a choppy way. Like, come on, NYU, come on. Like, where is your... Another thing I can do is just tether to my phone. Um, oops. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna tether to my phone. I, I don't wanna do things out of order. It's, so let me just um, tether here. So so for those of you like who are following along, like you can either tether yourself or, or just you know follow. Um, but I'll I'll do this for now. <clears throat> okay, so let me just reconnect. Reconnect. Initializing. Okay, so now. Now, if you get reconnected, uh, if you get disconnected and have to run it again, I think this shouldn't take as long because I think it won't. Um, I think some of the files persist, and if I'm not mistaken, they don't have to re-download. But I might be wrong about that. And actually, this thing is already screwy because I don't know if it's actually running. Hang on a second. Colab can be a little bit of a nuisance but okay connecting initializing why is it running it is is it Connect, allocating, initializing, run. Oh, I hope it doesn't have to do all this again. Um, I should probably make it figure. I think it has all these files already. No, I guess it doesn't. Sometimes I'm not sure. Sometimes like the files persist when you get disconnected momentarily. 
um, but I think here actually they don't. And so this hole, it's really annoying because here um, it has to it has to do all this stuff from scratch. Although it seems to be going faster, so maybe it's because it already had this stuff. So okay, this might this might actually be a little faster than I thought. Loaded model. Uh, one thing it does is it warms up the model, quote unquote, which means it does like a, a like a sort of random forward pass, and then that kind of generates the graph on the back end, and then it becomes a little faster. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> back to Gilbert Godfrey land as soon as this works. Um, I'll just run this, and then I'll just get back to telling you the code. Um, okay, so any list of z vectors, you can place them into a list and run them through make interpolation video, and then that that should generate a video, and then it doesn't download the video right away. There's kind of a weirdness where if you try to download it in the same function, it like often fails. Actually, it often fails anyway. Um, and so like the the files that download thing is a little unreliable, and so sometimes you have to like press it a couple times to make it work. Um, Okay, so we're, man, this thing is a little annoyingly slow. How many people are using it right now? Yeah. Uh, did that, am I good to go? I think this, yeah, okay. I think I'm, so now I can run this. So this will generate, let me make a shorter one. I'll make like 10 frames per second, or 10 frames per transition. So this will make this Godfrey interpolations and it's inside of a variable called video name. Once this is done, um, you just do files.download and then it should download it for you. Okay, let's see what that looks like. There we go. And you can loop it. It goes to the beginning. Oh no, I don't have it go to the beginning. Or did I? Oh yeah, so if you want to loop it, what you could do is put the first one at the end also, Z blonde, and then it'll make a perfect loop. I forgot to do that part. Okay, so that's cool. Um, this next one is to interpolate between two different faces. So uh, let's do that. Let's pick two faces. Who's got, who's got an idea for one? This isn't that big of a deal. Like anybody, anybody Jim will Carey. do. Who? Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey. As the mask. Jim Carrey and the mask. Uh, I think the mask thing might. <laughs> um, let's try with the beard. Let's get this little bearded guy. Sometimes it does funny things with beards. Like the beard will like recede or something, or it'll get washed out. Usually, it doesn't deal well with beards, but but I don't know. Let's let's give it a shot. Okay, and the second face. Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington. I love it. Where is it? which one? No, I'm looking at the um, the uh, interpolation. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's uh, good. let's try this one. What did you do? I I, I just opened. I finally opened the one that we were doing. <laughs> Some of these often like in Google Images, they give you really weird um, URLs. Okay, Denzel Washington and Jim Carrey. Okay, it's going to do uh, 40 frames, Z1 to Z2 to Z1. So it does a, it goes back, so it does a perfect loop. It'll just loop it, yeah? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would be, you know, that's the same thing as this, basically. There's just a list. So if you make a list bigger, if you go Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, um, you could totally do that. So like, that's how I made that ITP video mm -hmm. with the, that was at one of the labs. And you could also make modifications. We can make both of them blonde. You could like take every celebrity and make them blonde, you know, okay. um, or old, you know, whatever. Okay, that's done. So let's let's have a let's have a look. Yes. So, so this is kind of a this is kind of a neat thing. It's like if really <laughs> maybe like so yeah, like if you go zero point five of the way, you're basically getting the you know the the sort of like love child, you know, like the what their child might look like, or you know, like the clone that has half of each of their genes or something like that, right? So this is a great thing. Like we could make a matrix of all of us where at, like for every pair of us you can just do 0 0.5 of the way and so we can see all of our chimeras like <laughs> you know, our sort of uh <laughs> yeah yeah this is this is the future of reproduction everything's going to be digital you know not going to be yeah 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 totally this is how you're going to make your kids it's going to be all sort of like digital editing you know, so, so yeah, that's that's the glow notebook. There's really not much more to it. I mean, you know, there's there the, those are the building blocks. Now you can think of like before you do interpolation videos, maybe you might want to do you know funny things to the to the Z codes. There's also a lot of interesting ideas. Like okay, you can what's Z zero? What happens? It what what it, like we can we can actually do that. So like, what if we if you do Z zero, you should get basically the most the the central face. In the entire space, right? So z z zero equals uh, n p zeros, and it's got to be one. Um, what is it? Z shape, the last one, and then we do image zero equals decode z zero, and then display image zero center face. Yep. So. It's pretty weird that it's yeah. such a legible face, right? Like, what would the odds be that it would actually? It may it, because because basically this is the, uh, it's the centroid. It should it makes sense that it would be the if we did something random, it would like okay, let's do a random one. Let's see how that looks. NP random normal, and then I think it's like mean is zero one. Yeah, and then the number of elements. So let's. This is going to be random now. Oh, I screwed this up. Image uh, reshape array of size three. Oh, it's size three. Um, What's the other? Image? Oh, 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 sorry. It's like this actually. No, no, no. What's the other image is centered, like regardless of whatever you input. <laughs> So, sorry? The other image, is that like the center of all the images regardless of the input, or was it for the center? It's like the center, it's the, uh, no, 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 it hasn't, it's just the central image. It's a Z, Z, Z is zero. So everything is centered around zero. So yeah, this is just a random one. It, like, okay, standard deviation of one might, might be a little large. So like, okay, if we make it a little smaller, it'll basically, yeah. Okay, so these are all random people. No bias in this data set whatsoever. <laughs> I wanna, maybe it's a celebrity data set. I, I don't know. They look kind of celebrity-like, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just because celebrities look very symmetrical and, you know, this kind of stuff. <laughs> so anyway, um, you can do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, okay, are there any questions on, on Glow? Okay, let's uh, get back to the slides. Like, like, uh, 
No, it just produces images that are 256 by 256. That's the model. Uh, also, I should mention Runway has has a has a Glow model, um, and and this one I implemented, and I actually have one feature that I haven't worked into the into the notebook just yet, but one that instead of just doing doing a crop, it'll actually just take any image that you give you and just over um, just substitute the face for. So here I'll show you how that looks. Um, so th this one, this will work, be worked into the notebook. So basically you could do just like face substitution without having to do the cropping, which can be useful. Um, glow. So we do, we do like a camera input and then I select like, let's do the attractive vector. Let's make gene attractive. <laughs> and then we'll run this uh, remotely. Oh, camera. Camera. Okay. Is that something's wrong? I wonder if maybe because my camera is occupied, it's not. I'm having, this is usually not camera. Okay. Anyway, like, I actually, ha I have a. While this is starting, I can we can I can show you like this is what that looks like. So this is blonde hair, eyeglasses. Not bad, right? This is uh, bald. A hint of the near future. <laughs> attractive. Here's the attractive vector. Yeah, look at that. L'Oreal, here I come. Yeah. I mean, oh, and also, okay. I assume the attractive vector is just the people at OpenAI decided what they thought was attractive. I don't, I think, you know what I want to say? There is a data set where the, these are labeled, like, yeah. Um, and yeah, it, you know. Someone decided. Someone decided, yeah, totally. Usually they just Yeah, it might, it might be something like that. All right, this is taking too long, but, but okay, you can try this. Um, you can try this on your own. All right, so this is it. This is the last. This is the last. Uh, last bit of the lecture, and I want to introduce a project to you called a Dream Project called Abraham. And this is something I've been parading around for the last like six months, and I've I've sort of like I'm in the early stages of proposing it as a project. Now, it, of course, it's a little bit unusual and maybe even inappropriate to to sort of like uh, like to make part of a class a proposal for a specific project. But the reason why I want to do this is because. Um, is because, uh, but also because, um, but also because I actually think that the project has merits as as a sort of like a, you know an academic endeavor, even to the point that I uh, make my my I had a class here last year called autonomous artificial artists, and ne next semester I'm also going to be running this class in April May for those of you who are interested in in groundbreaking amazing classes. <laughs> Um, anyway, like uh, it's it's a really interesting project because it sort of combines a bunch of experimental, interesting fields together in a in a in in my opinion in a, in a unique way. And so I'm gonna try to make the case to you right now. All right, now um, and 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 also like this is not the class exactly. The class is just you know about the construction in general. But I have a project called Abraham, which I'm trying to promote as a vehicle for uh, for realizing this construction of an autonomous artificial artist. So what is Abraham? What is an autonomous artificial artist? So let me start by by um, telling you a bit about this thing that we we've, we've started calling AI arts, right? And this is kind of like a a term that that's been you know in the journalistic circles or so over the last two years, and it refers to people using AI to make arts, right? You know, GANs and generative models and and you know style transfer and all this kind of stuff, and um, and it and it really goes back farther because. There's been there's a long history, you know, for a couple of decades worth, let's say, of uh, artists and technologists and you know academics trying to create programs that make art, and then you know uh, uh, like uh, appealing to the AI analogy, the idea that they're making something that is exploring this idea of artificial intelligence. And some people use more ambitious language than others. You know, some people go, "This is an AI that's making an art." And then other people are, you know, a little bit more modest, I suppose. 
Um, but but um, but you know there is a history of this idea. You know, trying to make an AI that makes art. Um, concur. Uh, uh, oh yeah, and then I I also want to like highlight um, this project, which maybe some of you have heard of. You know, Harold Cohen's Aaron, right? Aaron. Uh, uh, was like a 30-year project by Harold Cohen, this artist named Harold Cohen, to basically make a an AI that painted, and it was framed as a as a drawing robot, and uh, running a program that this guy Harold Cohen, who died I think two years ago, he um, spent his whole life writing this program, and he programmed in all sorts of sort of dynamic, you know, stochastic rules, you know, things like choose a color palette with this amount of randomness, um, you know, follow these rules to make sure the colors are complementary, and then draw, you know, body parts and whatever. And like, you know, there's all this kind of randomness thrown in, you know, it's, it's parametrically modeled. So, so you can make it make things that look like real life, but it's, but they're essentially rule based, right? This is not a machine learning system. It's, it's actually like, a, it's just a really, really complex program with a lot of randomness. And so, it kind of like you know behaves like an AI, and so he you know he gave it a name, and he said this is Aaron, this is a you know a, an AI that makes art, right? And um, so okay, so there's there, there's a history of this, and you can you know you can debate whether or not um, whether or not the language you know is, is um, you know is correct or whatever, but that's that's sort of there's a history of this, right? Um, now concurrently to this, there's also this idea floating around the last few years of an art DAO. And um, now, the, first of all, to understand what an art DAO is, you have to understand what a DAO is. And this is kind of like, who's heard of this acronym, DAO, D-A-O? Okay, not so many. So a DAO is an acronym that stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And it's a very popular kind of futuristic concept in the crypto space, in the blockchain space, and so on. Um, the idea is that we now have the means to create, through the internet, um, organizations of people or computers, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, no one on the internet knows you're a cat, as the saying goes. Um, basically, we have the means of creating organizations which are decentralized. And uh, the, the decentralization aspect is straightforward enough. It means that, you know, all of the parts that go into it are decentralized in some manner. Maybe the governance is decentralized, maybe the comput computation is decentralized. You know, Bitcoin is a decentralized network that collaborates over a currency, right? So that's a decentralized network. The autonomous aspect is a little bit more, um, a little bit floatier, right? Um, now, autonomous means that it's an organ, it's an organization that basically um, it just goes, like, it, and and because it's decentralized, there's no on or off switch. Because it's decentralized, nobody gets to decide exactly how it works. Um, and because it's decentralized, it doesn't rely on any one person, right? So, so Bitcoin, you could have like all the people who own Bitcoin right now, they they could give all their Bitcoins to a whole different set of people, and then Bitcoin continues to go. Bitcoin doesn't care who holds Bitcoin, right? It's so this is kind of the idea of autonomous, and um, and now people are in the crypto space are trying to create DAOs that that do things that are more complex or sophisticated than just currencies, right? They're doing all sorts of things. People have ideas for for mostly financial instruments, but then, you know, you can imagine like, for example, a decentralized like or an autonomous social media platform that has, and, you know, and, you know, of course, there's all sorts of dangers to this lurking and, you know, we can get into a whole, well, it would take a whole class to to, to, to get into that, right? But that's, that's kind of the, the DAO idea. So the art, and then this has been floating around since for at least three years, three or four years, DAO, DAO idea. Now in this space, um, two two people who I happen to have the pleasure of meeting both of them, um, they're really interesting people, work in the crypto space. Uh, one is named Trent McConaughey, who's in Berlin, Simon de la Rubia, who's in South Africa. And they kind of simultaneously and together came up with this art DAO idea, which is a DAO that makes art. Uh, and, the, and the idea is that, you know, it's a, maybe a program that's making some generative art, and it, and it will um, release it under some kind of a you know blockchain system, and then people can buy it, and then they can buy it. And, you know, it's it's a smart contract, so it's basically running its own currency, or not its own currency, its own wallet. So you can pay this program to give you an artwork, and then it uses the proceeds to pay for its own computation, basically. <laughs> so this is totally something that's possible. Like we can create autonomous wallets. That already the technology for that already exists. It's not super secure, but it exists. 
Um, so, so what that means is that like there's nothing stopping us in prin in pr principle from making um, like computer programs that 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 are millionaires or billionaires. Right? <laughs> Imagine you made a program that makes compelling art and people want to pay it, and then it has its own currency and it's and it's a smart contract that someone put on the blockchain means they don't own it anymore. And so, you know, this thing could make tons of money. Like, just imagine an entity <laughs> like that's like sucking up all of the wealth from from the world, and you know, just storing it. That's that's really like that's not sci-fi. That's that that's actually like that's kind of possible. Um, and um, it actually like it makes me think of a, an art project from a long time ago, or maybe not lo that long ago, maybe ten years ago, um, called Google will eat itself. I think. Does anyone know this project? Um, basically, it's a, it's a, it's some kind of a program that is running uh, Google ads, and then using the proceeds to buy Google stock. I think <laughs> so. It's just kind of like eating itself. Anyway, um, that's something else. But the point is that okay, this art DAO idea. It's been around, and for me, when I saw this, I, I felt like it was kind of the missing piece a little bit to the to the idea of the artificial artist. Because, uh, oh, and I, and I should say a little bit like the art DAO thing. Art DAOs have not exactly been realized yet because for reasons that we'll get into in, in a little while. But there is this big crypto uh, art market that's been emerging, and maybe people have seen this a little bit. And, and and the way this works is more or less that like people make artworks and then they trade them on a blockchain. So you can kind of create a decentralized platform that lets artists you know, sort of exchange artworks and, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of, there's a lot of opportunity here, I'd say. I'm not super involved in this, but I think it's, I think it's cool, cool, very cute. Um, and, and actually like Crypto is a, is a nice example because what they did is they have a crypto art market, but they, what they, they actually used a GAN to generate images of anime um, or, or manga, I guess, and then they, then these are all become collectibles. And what's cool is that they use the, the latent, the latent code as the um, as the address essentially, it's like the public address of this of this uh, generative you know work, um, and um, so there's a lot of like the pieces are already there a little bit right, um, and then there have been some art DAO sort of like like projects and these are a few of them. So this is kind of neat. This Larva Labs Autoglyphs. What they did was they they have a smart contract that actually produces each of these itself. You know, each of these are like uh, are some simple program, and so the program that actually makes the artwork is already on the blockchain, and so you're getting kind of most of the way there. It's the same thing over here with this generative, and then Simon, who who uh, came up with the art DAO thing, he has this autonomous, which is basically trying to run some kind of a procedural generative art program in JavaScript, I think, which generates artworks and then stamps them, puts them on the blockchain, yada yada yada. Um, now. All of these, in my opinion, I would say all of these projects and and also the AI artists kind of lack a few key characteristics, which makes them, in my opinion, not quite the same thing as an autonomous being that makes art, right? And the the the, um, the metaphor that I like is the ventriloquist, right? Who knows what a ventriloquist is? Everybody, right? It's like the you know you kind of, so. You know, you you pretend to talk. You know, the ventriloquist is really good at not moving their mouth, and then you know they make the the dummy talk, right? And and so with the with Aaron, let's say for example, Harold Cohen programmed Aaron, and so for me, Aaron is a dummy, and Harold Cohen is the ventriloquist. It's kind of like he's speaking through Aaron. Aaron is not autonomous. Aaron is is really a puppet, right? And um, and I think that's actually true. Of these of these systems, even though they're not necessarily limited to one artist, but they're a known algorithm. So so anyone can take this and, and basically they can copy the algorithm and produce things off chain, right? So it's a little bit like like saying that you know it's as though you could take Mozart's brain and then download it and then make your own Mozart pieces with it, right? So that's kind of like the limitation of these. They're using known algorithms, right? And so. Um, uh, and so my um, idea is to kind of is to make an art DAO where the program that generates the art is learned, it, and it's learned from from everybody basically, or from as many people as possible, and it's learned in a way that that makes it so that the program itself, like the artworks, are um, the program that makes the artworks is un is irreproducible, can't be reproduced. You can't download it and then make it make it work somewhere else. Um, it's basically a shared secret, 
in a sense. And this is actually a real term in cryptography, a shared secret. And so, um, and so here's what I propose. A generative art program uh, whose behavior emerges from collective intelligence. A whole lot of actors who uh, influence the art program. And the art program itself is decentralized. Nobody has the whole thing. And, and it makes art autonomously. And I associate this with true autonomous independence being, you know, consciousness, I would even say. I, and I'm really serious about that. I know people are not going to, people don't let me get away with it usually, but I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a safe space, so <laughs> I'm going to use the C word. Um, the reason, the, the, the consciousness. Um, the, so the, the reason why I, I believe this, is, this, this, this metaphor can be made is because um, is uh, I'm going to use a, another metaphor to kind of support my case. So bees, when you have a whole bunch of bees and they have this colony, um, th we have this term of a hive mind, right? And there's other related terms, collective intelligence, right? There's this idea that we can attach human cogn cognitive uh, capacities to, um, you know, like uh, networks of smaller interacting decentralized agents, right? So the, the hive itself has a mind. Right. And and uh, collective intelligence is like there's a sort of separate intelligence which emerges from the collective. So I think that if you created a system which combined sort of blended all of our creativity together into a system in which none of us control, but it's sort of like harnessing all of our collective creativity, you have this you have this sort of hive creativity. Right. You have a, and it has its own character that is separate from any of us. And from any from each of the from the perspective of each individual who is involved in this in this, the agent seems to be decoupled from them. Like it doesn't feel like okay, if I move it this way, it changes in this way. It's like they 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 know they're influencing it, but they don't know how exactly. It's kind of like, like and and I would say like a, a human artist is kind of the same way, right? A human artist is influenced by many by many people, right? And so this is kind of like a more formal way of, of, of doing that, modeling it in the computer science system. So it's a generative art program, which is controlled by many people in a decentralized network whose behavior is sort of, uh, is, the emer is emergent, right? In the, this natural emergence from the, from the collected actions of many people. Um, so, so that's the objective. Make uh, an auto and, and I, I call this an autonomous artificial artist. And so this has it has its own. It must demonstrate agency, that it that it it feels autonomous, like it has its own will, and it must create unique and original works. And I define. I actually have a whole definition that, that in the paper that I wrote, basically what unique and original actually means. But roughly speaking, it means original means that it's not its work is not derived from any one person. It's not derivative of any person, right? It's not like Aaron's work is derivative from Harold Cohen, right? Um, Larva's uh, Larva Labs uh, is derivative from a known program that I don't know maybe maybe comes from computer science. Um, this creates sort of original. It's like things that haven't been seen before. And unique means that it's that it or that only Abraham. In, in this, if it's Abraham, but only Abraham, Abraham is an autonomous artificial artist. If it creates unique works, and unique means that only Abraham can make them. Now, that's not that doesn't mean that the works can't be copied, right? Like you can take a recording of Mozart and make a digital copy of it, and then you go, "I have a Mozart here." That's not what I mean by copied. I mean that you can't make a new Mozart with the program that makes Mozart's Mozart's works, right? Because that's that's contained in Mozart's brain. Um, and so, like, there's no way to download Abraham, right? There's just and and the way that you can achieve that is through basically mass decentralization of all of the parts that are that make up Abraham. And um, this comes this is inspired a little bit by nature, right? This idea of emergence comes from nature. I already mentioned the hive mind idea, um, and you know, of course, this occurs in things like termite mounds. Uh, bird flocks, you know, and this is really popular, of course, nature of code type stuff, right? You kind of see emergent patterns from from interactions between many small actors. Mm -hmm. And also this idea of dunes I really like because a dune, you know, you see dunes here, right? But dunes don't exist, right? Only sand exists. There's just grains of sand. But then, you know, the, the, the uh, 
Dune is an emergent phenomenon which we associate with a particular configuration of sand particles. And, and many philosophers, depending on, you know, like, and I'm not super deep into the cognitive philosophy, but there is like this uh, school of thought that says that consciousness is essentially an emergent phenomenon from a bunch of small cognitive processes that, that people have. This is the so-called computational theory of mind. And it's very controversial, you know, like many, many philosophers have their big philosophy debates about this, but, but that it is a school of thought that basically like consciousness is is that it's like like you have a uh like a very complex being and there's all these and it's complex because there's a lot of simple things happening at the same time which which are interacting with each other and they produce a very emergently complex behavior and this and then when you see something in front of you that appears to be that complex you go oh it must be conscious right and then um i mean and there's we could go deep into that whole thing but basically that's just this whole other this whole other principle. And I, I, I think like we can create it too. And this is the only way to create it possibly um, it, it, that, that we know of. So how might this work technically? So first of all, um, what, what can generate complex behavior, right? Um, a generative model, right? We've, we've uh, machine learning, like basically reinforcement learning, machine learning, this can all create complex behavior. Um, and, um, and so, you kind of let's let's start by dismantling things that we know and turning them into into a different construction. First of all, start with centralized machine learning, right? All of the machine learning that we've done in this class so far, it, it, it work, and all of the machine learning that you interact with basically is something like this, right? You have some AI agency, you know, Google, Microsoft, IBM, whoever, and they have a neural network that they're trying to train, and so you they have a whole bunch of users. The users send them data. AI Incorporated takes all that data, trains a machine learning model on it, and provides services in the form of cat videos, mostly. <laughs> and then uh, for free. And this exchange is free. Both, both ways it's free. And then uh, AI Incorporated, um, you know, maybe trades access to the data or to the model for in exchange for some money. And so that's kind of how, how and they finance their service that way. So that's, the, that's, that's how machine learning works all over the internet. And it's been working that way for a, a long time. Uh, now this problem, this model has, um, and this is this is a little bit of a detour from the whole artificial uh, autonomous artificial artist idea, um, but it's worth getting into because it's also more justification for pursuing this idea because it actually connects to other things that we might care about. So, for example, one thing we care about is how centralized machine learning has all these drawbacks, right? So one thing is that with centralized machine learning, you have all these like every week it seems like some unbelievably extreme breach of uh, you know privacy has been committed because all this data is sort of sitting in some honeypot um, there's of course like privacy issues of course right people don't want to give up data that's very sensitive which is which actually is kind of a, a shame because a lot of really amazing applications are essentially not possible because because of privacy concerns uh, legitimate ones right so for example like imagine we, we know that we can predict a lot of things, a lot of really personal things about people from personal data. And a lot of those things could be really useful to us, right? They're usually useful to Facebook. Um, they can predict, for example, that you, like, bef they, they know that you're going to get engaged before you are, before you do. That's like some, some kind of a, um, some, some, something. But, um, but, if, but okay, like, um, it, there's a lot of things you can learn about yourself from data, right? Because we're always lying to ourselves, right? So, but data is, data doesn't, I mean, data is a little bit more concrete. And so um, there's all these health applications, for example, mental health, physical health applications that rely on sensitive data that we just can't do because the data is too sensitive. And then there's research into medical applications that relies on sensitive data that just doesn't get off the ground. And so there's a lot of interest right now in industry and in academia in creating ways of doing privacy preserving machine learning right um, and another problem is of course this idea that uh, this has been floating around since the early days of the internet da uh, data is not recognized as, as as a sort of like valuable commodity that you create right you create data and you give it to the to these companies and you do it for free without any expectation of pay um, but that doesn't necessarily make any sense because the data in aggregate is actually very valuable. So isn't your piece of it, like, shouldn't you get paid for it? I mean, first of all, there is 
even though people don't recognize it as such, it is kind of labor to produce it. Um, you know, labor in the formal sense of the word. And then it also, um, you know, it has value. So, you know, there's this uh, metaphor, data is the new oil, um, which may or may not be useful. But, but the point is that um, the point is that data is valuable in some sense. And then, of course, you have these like like uh, these companies are bigger than any company that's ever existed. I mean, transnational, you know, two billion customers. Like, how long ago was it that the idea of one company having two billion customers was totally unthinkable? I mean, it's not even that long ago. It's it, these are totally new paradigms that we've that we've um, accomplished because of centralized machine learning. And also, one of the problems with the one of the problems with centralized machine learning is that it's resulted in internet that looks like this. I love this. This is this is what every website and this is what every website looks like now. It's like fifteen thousand, you know, like uh, yeah, like get me to your website. Come on, <laughs> chatbot, you know, ad blocker, turn it off. <laughs> and the website's broken. Sharon's, yeah. This is every website in the world looks like this now. You have to. Oh, God. This is cool. Yeah. It's like every single website looks like this. What is going on? Like, this is five years ago, you go onto a website and then you just look at it. Mm. Now it's like there's a. There's. I mean, it's just unthinkable. It is a, here's a great example of this, actually. Like, I want to. <laughs> This is a great, great. Uh, am I looking for a tweet? Am I really doing this? This is. This. Oh, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like like pop ups from the top and bottom. It's brilliant. This is, this is what the what's this what your phone looks like? You like open up a website and half of the screen is taken up by like a, a like a privacy warning. So this is this is what the internet looks like now, um, yeah. Okay, so there's a few technologies. Um, uh, I'll go for another five ten minutes, and then we'll be done. So okay, there's a few technologies which which can, which can uh, make pri make privacy a central part of the internet, right? One is federated learning. Uh, federated learning is a mode of machine learning in which instead of centralizing the data and learning a model from it and then providing services, instead, then the data is never collected. The model is copied and sent to each of the users. And then the users train the model a little bit on their own data, generating gradients, learning updates, and they send those back to AI Incorporated. They average them together and they make the model smarter that way. Um, now this, uh, achieve some level of privacy. It turns out the federated learning by itself does not guarantee privacy because you can actually infer data from the gradients, but that's a whole separate other issue. There's all sorts of ways of getting around that. There's this idea of secure aggregation where you mix up the gradients together in a, in a controlled environment and then all of the data is, is lost, right? And so, the, and, and this is not novel technology, like this is actually already, a, when you do spell check, for example, on your phone, you're not sending your keystrokes to Apple or, or Google, you're actually doing federated learning. That's how they update those models. And so federated learning actually works a little bit at scale. It's not exactly everything that we need for privacy preserving machine learning, but it's a good start, right? Um, and now the thing is like federated learning does have, uh, like I said, it doesn't guarantee privacy. The model can be stolen now, so that's a problem. Uh, the lost natural income pr is still a problem. Um, you still have these data oligopoly problems. And then, of course, like it drains your batteries now, which is kind of funny. It's like, yeah, you get to keep your data, but we're going to use your electricity to train our machine learning models. So that's kind of like a little bit of a getting kicked while you're down. I'm a really big fan of Open Mind, which is a, a project that I have some interaction with. This is a community that's working on trying to basically create a system that involves federated learning plus some other things. This, this graphic is out of date now, actually. It doesn't really have a smart contract or anything involved. But the point is they're trying to create machine learning tools that, that uh, make it possible to basically a combination of federated learning with a few other like very fancy sort of encryption schemes and what's called multi-party computation to try to create a framework for privacy preserving secure machine learning, right? And so that's a, they're trying to develop these technologies really, really early open days. Now, federated learning is the most mature part of the Abraham project, which, and it's not even that mature. So this is where things start to get really weird. So now imagine instead of just decentralizing the data, and this is what I desire. I want to split the model, 
I want the model itself, this neural network, to be not in any one place, let alone all places, but to be split into a social network, basically. So we have this idea of a social network. Imagine if the social network were a neural network itself, right? So in other words, like all of us are the nodes of a neural network, and to do a forward pass or a backward pass through the neural network, we have to do this communication through this peer-to-peer -peer network, right? So you guys are the first layer of the network, you guys are the second layer, third layer, and I send you uh, a, like an input that goes through each of you. You compute the activations and then send those to, to you guys and you guys have the weights for the second layer and so on. It has to go through this kind of like, a, like this scheme. And if you implement this, and there's a, there's a lot of ways that this could this could be done like and then but you know but if you do this the point is that nobody has the whole neural network and so nobody can do a forward pass on it without all of us are required right and so you can create a a peer to peer network which which implements a whole neural network and this is a way of decentralizing of course activity in the neural network and all and and it has all sorts of secondary properties that are useful for abraham um now who wants to do this, right? Well, nobody, because it's like, why would you do this? This is almost useless. Like, uh, so I want to make it basically, but but then, <laughs> like, but then also there is there is um, an emerging um, interest also coming from mostly on privacy uh, grounds to make stuff like this, right? Because because certainly people in the crypto space see utility to this. Like, if you decentralize a neural network, you can you can create services that are as powerful as Google and Facebook and all of them but without the Google and Facebook part of them, right? So like imagine that all of us were implementing a social network together and we're doing all this complicated machine learning on it to make it work really, really well, but that we, we essentially were doing it as a, as a, like a, in a, as a decentralized group. Like none of us, there's no CEOs, there's no, there's no board of governors there. And you need essentially everyone's permission. And there's some kind of a, like a, complicated democracy that's programmed into it. So there's a lot of people who, who you know, utopians, let's call them, who like really see utility to this. There's a lot of people who think that this is the worst idea in the world. And, 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 I, and I am sympathetic to both. Like I think actually it is, it's the best idea in the world and the worst idea in the world. Um, and there's really no way of getting around that. And so that's gonna be something that like we, so okay, so my neural network is basically running a generative model. There's a decentralized generative model. It's a GAN that's been, or an autoencoder that's been spread all over the world, right? And um, this is a more formal graphic that I have in my paper that, you know, I, the idea is now to do a query, which is to sample an image from, the, from this network, uh, not, not, not just a query, but really to even train it, to forward pass through it it has to propagate through this entire network, which means it's really complicated. Now you have this all this network transmission stuff. Like if one person goes offline, the whole thing stops. I mean, there's all sorts of problems that make this really untenable for now. Uh, but imagine we have this construction. Then to train it, the data has to propagate through the whole network. And if it's done in a federated way, the data is never collected, which means that you have, like at the end of the training process, you have a neural network, all the data is discarded. So there's no way to recover the training data. So you couldn't train it yourself. And the network itself is, is spread among multiple people who, who are not colluding. So in other words, it's a shared secret. It's basically, it's a program that can generate this, this thing, but no one person has it. Right? No one person has all of the weights. No one person or even group of people can recover all of the data necessary to retrain it. And so that accomplishes the uniqueness component of it. And its originality comes from the fact that it's maybe the, the data is crowdsourced. And so what it generates is who knows, like its aesthetic is kind of determined from the crowd, which means it could be terrible. I mean, and you know, like uh, we can imagine all sorts of ways it could be terrible. But, and that's, like I said, like worst thing in the world and best thing in the world. Um, so it's decentralized, it's irreproducible, as I mentioned. And because of all of these components are fulfilled, I believe that it demonstrates agency. Because if you look at it, even if you're involved in its making, it feels like it's doing its own thing. You know, it's like you, you can get, you can even stop interacting with it and it'll keep on going without you. So this is why, why I think it, it fulfills this autonomy aspect. It has its own agency. It's not a dummy. It's not, uh, and you know, because there's no ventriloquist. There's all this stuff that I'm gonna skip now because we're just running out of time, but there's all sorts of stuff in the crypto space about how to govern these, because okay, now you have this problem of how do we govern it? It's like all of us are 
working at it and it's and there's a lot of complications it's like how do you govern a decentralized autonomous organization um right now this is this is one of those things that's in like super early theoretical days people are writing about it a lot online um no one's really made this in practice but but in you know slowly but surely a lot of these systems might become real there's all this stuff in the crypto space about economic models for this also like how that might work so like what if the what if abraham is producing art that's valuable so like maybe Abraham is selling the art, right? <laughs> so like, and who gets the proceeds? Well, Abraham does. Abraham's an organization. Abraham sells its, Abraham sells Abraham's artwork, and then you know maybe there's like some kind of a governance system that that involves tokens or something like that that gives people decision making power. Maybe people have the financial incentive to actually contribute. Uh, maybe people get paid for their training data and so on. There's all the, this kind of stuff. I'm super far away from all this. This is like a very very like third fourth order. A consideration mostly I'm focusing on technology right now um, so so okay like that's that's all stuff in the crypto space so let's put a sell a soul in the DAO and also one other thing I want to mention is that I believe this models the collective imagination so this idea is that if you um, take everybody's images and you you know and however we perceive the world and how we label that and then in a decentralized manner we train a generative model in it it's approaching something of a sort of like the base of our consciousness, or like the base of our collective unconscious. Is anyone familiar with the collective unconscious idea? The Carl Jung's idea that like there, that we, you have your, your consciousness, right? You have your conscious mind, but then there's an unconscious, which is, you know, a, psycho a psychology idea. But then Jung's idea is that we sort of um, are born with, with uh, inherited unconscious that's filled with all these archetypes that are evolved, um, basically evolved like over millions of years, and that they're common to all people. And so uh, this is a super, you know, it's a psychology idea. It's not necessarily very empirical, but this is a way of empirically materializing it. I think we can actually materialize the unconscious mind, the unconscious creativity of all people through a system like this. And so this is kind of like for me, um, one of the things that makes makes it interesting and worthwhile. The idea is super like uh, cross-disciplinary, right? I mean, there's obviously concepts from computer art and artificial intelligence. And then there's this whole crypto economics thing, which is super, you know, like not, not really my wheelhouse, but it's a, you know, the decentralization movement has its own stuff that they're working on. There's this whole philosophy of mind concept and all of these ideas lie at their, in at their intersection. But the autonomous artificial artist is right smack in, in the middle of them, um, I think. And so I think the idea is really, really like, um, well, the idea is very, you know, it, it kind of gets into this. Um, it, it's very, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of layers to it. And then, um, so, okay, like, there, uh, like, I don't know if I'll keep this, but like, there's all this sort of like, Abraham is obviously an allusion to the, to the biblical figure. I have a whole like pretentious idea for why that is. Like you can read about that in the first article. Um, Abraham is also a reference to Aaron because uh, Harold Cohen said that he intended Aaron to be the first in a series of alphabetically named robots that he would work on. So Aaron AA was the first one, mm -hmm. and he ended up spending his whole life working on Aaron and never got to the second one. And so I think Abraham would have been a good, you know, solid for a second name. Um, and so there's all these things that need to be done. We have to figure out how it works. Um, you know, we need we need artists, and we need and there's a whole curation mechanism behind that that could be that could go into this writing about it and so on. So there's all this kind of stuff that fits neatly. And then I have this idea to kind of t take workshops and make workshops into like to give them a little bit more of a purpose and also to like workshops to kind of study the components of Abraham and this idea of autonomous artificial artists and, uh, and the idea is to call these creations, of course, um, the terminology, the, the, of course, the terminology is just an endless like a uh, rabbit hole you, know, you could use. So for example, if there's a, it has a token, it's gotta be called Isaac and you know. Anyway, um, so yeah, these are the building blocks um, and um, this is just a joke. Like I, I really, I don't know. I really like these memes. Um, so yeah, and, and this is really not 2020, it's probably a lot later. Um, so anyway, the, the thing is like, I am not of course a leader of this project. I'm not the creator, right? Like no one can create Abraham, right? I'm a prophet. Like I, I've, I am. I've been sent. I've been sent here to 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 gather a team to 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 spread the gospel of of Abraham. 
Um, okay, so that's it. Uh, next week we're gonna do these uh, presentations. Like, please let me know what you're working on, um, and um, and that'll be this will be me. You can all be talking next week, and and I'm, I'll I'll just be like sitting and observing. Um, I think that's all. So yeah, like I said, tomorrow office hours, and um, let me know if you want to meet Thursday, Friday. I should be uh, I should be mostly around. And uh, that's all. Um, see you next week. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.